This is what we know about the hotel. It is bigger on the inside than the outside. Do not go into room 63. Doors and windows do not stay in the same places. The hotel listens when you speak. The hotel watches. The hotel looks different to different people. We'll be at the hotel soon. The hotel is familiar. The hotel is a stranger in an alley. It is difficult to find information about the hotel online and a degree of patience is needed. The language used to write about the hotel is difficult, tangled. But it is possible to hunt down small snippets of information to trawl through history for the signs. Before the hotel, there was a farm on the land. The farm was a small building and cannot have had more than a few chickens, perhaps some pigs. Before the fire that destroyed the farm and the sale of the land, which led to the building of the hotel, a woman lived in the property, the wife of a descendant, and died there also. The woman seemed to be notorious in the surrounding area as someone who had some talent in prediction. At this time, there was recorded a spate of child deaths, which can now probably be attributed to farm runoff into the water supplies, but was then blamed on the woman and led to her being drowned in the pond out the back of the farm. Before she drowned, she was recorded to have scratched some words into the front door of the house. The words read, I'll see you soon. The hotel exhibits what might be described as personality traits. It seems to know the people who come and go within its walls. Perhaps, more insidiously, the hotel seems to collect people to it, has a magnetism that is sometimes impossible to ignore. The curse that follows the hotel might be placed solely on the unnamed woman who was killed there, but it seems likely that any unfortune came in fact from the earth itself, and that she was only the first person to note it. The hotel build is rife with issue, and for a long time, it looks like it may remain unfinished. The ground is sodden and swallows the foundations. There are accidents when scaffolding fails. Trees that are dug up one day reassert themselves over the weekend. Still, it is done. The building is finished in 1919. The style is Gothic revival, long chimneys, stained glass which dims the light, an orchard. This is where everything begins. In the 1950s, a poet better known for her meandering nature poems wrote a few lines about the hotel embedded in a longer, strange piece about a lost love and a failed suicide attempt. In the poem, the hotel appears as a dangerous place which reappears through history in different guises. A year later, the poet succeeds where before she had failed and is drowned in the sea off the North Norfolk coast. In the boarding house where she is staying is a notebook with scraps of writing, some scrawled images in pen, the most distinctive of which seems to be of the hotel, recognisable by its severe chimneys. Beneath the drawings, the poet has written, I'll be there soon. In the early 90s, there is a series of accidents at or near the hotel, the girlfriend of a relatively well-known married politician is found locked inside one of the rooms, starving, wild-eyed. A group of schoolchildren who are camping in the local forest get lost, and, when they are found, appear to have lost the ability to speak or understand language. More, smaller incidents abound. 
Room keys become embedded in the flesh of hands. People working in the hotel fall down the stairs or end up locked in the lifts. For a year, the hotel is closed for renovations, and when it opens up again, there is a time when nothing is recorded. The hotel is no longer the haunt of the upper classes, but becomes popular for weddings and anniversaries, for work conferences. The hotel seems to be seasonal, sometimes cyclical, in that years can go with relative peace, and then there is disturbance. What seems clear is that the hotel does not affect everyone in the same way. For some, it is possible to visit and to see nothing out of the ordinary. The hotel is not far from Cambridge or the sea on the train. In the winter, there are big fires in the bar, and the rooms are warm dressing gowns hanging from the back of the bathroom doors. The newspapers are left outside the doors in the morning, and it is possible to order breakfast in bed. Sometimes there are oysters fresh that morning. A review online says, I really needed a break, and the hotel was perfect. I am so rested, I am so much calmer. A review online says, I saw her for the first time since she died, and she looked the same. The soap at the hotel is made at a Cotswold lavender farm, and the coffee is fair trade and good, with milk from a local dairy herd. A review online says, Next time, we are asking for room 63. For some, it is possible to visit and come away contented, looking forward to returning. For others, it is not this way. It is difficult to pin down exactly what type of person will visit the hotel and see it exactly for what it is. Often they are solitary, separated from their families, or preferring to live alone, troubled by social situations, nervous in crowds. Many drink too much or find it difficult to sleep, have obsessive tendencies. Almost all are women. Some find it hard to let go. Still, there are those who do not drink, who come with their families or friends, who enjoy crowded rooms and long phone conversations, and they too will hear how the TVs in the hotel sometimes speak to one another or the windows move in the night. It is not possible with any certainty to go to the hotel and feel safe. It is not wise to ever do so. It is hard to say why people come to the hotel despite most knowing the mythology surrounding it. The hotel is listed as one of the most haunted buildings in Britain. Accounts of activity at the hotel are widespread. For many, this alone is reason enough to visit, out of morbid curiosity or disbelief. But for some, those who work and live near the hotel, there is always the question of why. Why don't they leave? Why do they so often return again and again to a place that is clearly not only unsettling, but for some, dangerous. This question can only be posed by those who have not visited the hotel. To go there, even once, is to feel something that might be akin to a tidal pull, which exerts itself against all better judgments. Not only is it difficult not to return physically after a prior visit, it is also seemingly hard to stop the mind wandering towards that building, tall and grey, on the dark Fenland. In 2016, the hotel sits closed for three years. Though there are occasional interested buyers, the hotel's reputation precedes itself and no sale goes through. Nature reasserts itself quickly. Mice breed in the walls. 
In the summer, teenagers break in and make fires in the dark rooms. Sometimes, stray dogs or cats get in and become trapped, emerge all tooth. Occasionally, there are forays from groups interested in the occult or stray couples looking for a thrill. In 2019, the hotel is burnt to the ground. The fires can be seen from the motorway. In the grounds of the hotel, buried beneath a cluster of willow trees, a film camera is found. The footage is partly destroyed, but it appears to show a group of amateur filmmakers from York University who broke into the building the week before it was destroyed. The students are not yet to be found, and the footage on the cameras is inconclusive, ending abruptly, so it is not apparent whether they began the fire or had any knowledge of who did. Towards the end of the film, there are images from a particular room, the white walls damp and sagging with mould. In the bathroom, above the tub, the camera holds for a couple of moments on some graffiti. A single phrase visible, I'll be there soon. It is nearly impossible to collate and logically place all the stories about the hotel, to begin and then to find some sort of ending, a moment of catharsis. And in this beginning, what to include? The drawings of a small child in a Cornish nursery of a red door with the number 63 written on it? The email a woman wrote to her son the day before she died, in which she said repeatedly, I'll be there soon, I'll be there soon, the cathedral in Ely, which occasionally reported sightings in the night of a mirage hotel room set before the altar, the bed made, the TV on. And if a beginning is attempted and somehow made successful, where then is an ending found? Is it possible that the hotel ceases when it burned down, or is it not more likely that the land itself holds some forbidding sense of identity. What grows there now? Nothing. What doors are there in the ground? Many. And is it possible that even though the hotel is gone, there is still some days a flash of it, a startling after image of a building, tall chimneys, open front door? It is not yet the end. It is time, tentatively, for a start. Fourteen stories of the hotel in the Fens. My husband brought me to this farmhouse to be his wife, and though I was not born here, this is where I will die. My name is Mary Southgraves, and though I am ordinary in most every way, since I was a child I have had some talent at seeing what is ahead. This uncanny knowledge frightened my mother and angered my father, and I became clever at keeping it to myself. These truths come to me in dreams, or in the strong daylight they are spoken out loud into my head, or put fully in words into my mouth. By the time I was a married woman and came here to this flat place, I had learned how to be silent, and my husband did not know that I could see the milk curdling before it did, or knew when the old farm cat would die and how. I would keep quiet if I could, but this land increases a power which was only ever small and insignificant and makes it large, and this farmhouse sits like a sullen demon upon it, 
and draws the knowledge from me. I am willful here, and find myself wild. Worse, I find the knowing comes so strongly that it lays time flat, and it is near impossible to tell the present from the future. In describing the farmhouse to me, my husband grew it larger and grander than it is, added on rooms, created warmth where there is nothing but cold stone. There is a kitchen with a fire that smokes, and a wooden table with one leg shorter than the others. There is a windowless bedroom, which in the winter months we share with the chickens. Off the kitchen is a scullery, a place that I do not go. This is the extent of my prison, and beyond the windows, the fens, great dark fields, the barn where the pigs live, the pond where I will die. My husband is a kind man, but in the last months he has become afraid of me, and I know he goes and speaks to the other men, farmers all, about this fear. I cannot help telling him of what I see, of the small mistakes he will make that will lead to the desolation of this farm, of the sadness that will rule his life. I cannot help also telling the women who sometimes come by, looking for gossip or free eggs, who have started keeping their distance and treating me with a wary dislike. I know they speak of me in the village and sometimes send their children around to pull my drying sheets into the mud on wash day, they are sharp-tongued, but it does not stop them coming to me when they are with child or cannot sleep or grow so tired with fear and want only to know whether that knowing will bring them peace or only despair. They come in the night without light and scrape their fingernails against the kitchen window and I speak to them faceless in the dark and they leave flour or sacks of potatoes as payment. For a time, my husband and I carried love between us so carefully, like a basket of eggs. When it was jostled, he would straighten it, and I would move my hip to keep us even, to give us happiness. We held this love at times in our hands and felt it warm our palms, and I thought of his softly dimpled cheeks, the rough pads of his thumbs, the farmhouse appeared on the flats ahead of us, and he held my cheek and spoke of children and of long years and seeing it coming. I knew that we would have none of these, and that the ground beneath the farm was ill with hatred. My husband led me around the building with great pride, and when we came to the scullery, I felt a fear I have never felt before a mighty wave which silenced my voice. My husband showed me this space with pride and said that when his mother had lived in the farm, she had once filled the shelves with 63 jars of preserved fruit and vegetable, an enormous amount, and the number rang through me and hurt my gums, and I saw every one of those 63 jars smashed to the floor and my husband's mother's wrists torn, as if bitten by the glass. Ever after, I think of that room as 63, and I will not go in there. The number comes to me in the night, and I have to muffle my face against the pillow to stop me from saying it out loud. I do not know what it is about this land, but it has some hold. I had always hoped in death I would return to the place I was born, but I know now that I will linger here, making the same steps I have made day by day in life. It is said that bodies do not rot in this earth, but stay preserved, and perhaps that is why this place calls its dead to it. I will be there soon, I think and I will see the reams of those who have gone before, and who cluster in this small space like animals, pressing their flat faces to the world of the living. At times I long for it, 
though it is not peace and it is not quiet. There is some sickness in the water which I dream about one night. The wells are stagnant and the rivers have carried a water plague from upstream. I boil the well water and try to speak to my husband about the disease which will be especially cruel to the young and the very old. He lowers his head towards the table and eats his breakfast without looking at me, the way he has taken to doing when I speak about anything he does not believe in. I take a basket of bread and go to the other farmhouses which lie across the fields between here and the village. The children see me coming and go running with my name on their lips to their mothers who stand with their legs braced on the ground and watch me until I am close. I offer them bread and they become civil, but when I speak of the sickness that is in the water, they anger and will not talk to me. I see the faces of the children who will die like bright stars. These women do not trust me because I have not been, and never will be, able to have a child, but their own children go now calmly to death and they do nothing. What is in this land is some possessive quality, some unquietness. It is clear to me that there are places which have as much personality as any person or animal, and this is one of them. This land knows the way I know. This land can see everything. It can see us and what lies ahead. I am afraid here, and would like to leave. But that is not what happens. The first of the children fall sick and the news is heard all over. The sickness is bad and the child is dead by nightfall. We grieve this body that used to be someone's baby. We put it in the ground where, in a month, it will rise swollen to the surface. The mother comes in the deep of the night to our house and slams her morning flesh against our door and tries to call me out, and my husband locks me in the scullery for protection. I sit in the scullery with my eyes closed and my hands over my ears, and I hear the voice of my husband's dead mother counting those sixty-three jars, and I wait for her to realise I am there. There are many deaths and the graveyard is full. I am beset upon on the way to the village and beaten bloody. They try to take my tongue, but I run from them, and when I make it home my husband will not look or speak to me. They think I have killed the children with my words, and I cannot convince them otherwise. When I wake, I am in the scullery again, and there is the glint of glass in my hand which I have placed against my throat. There were sixty-three jars here, and this is the room of sixty-three fears, all clamouring, all so loud. It is this room I will come back to, and perhaps this room leads only into the ground. Bad floods and the bodies of the recently dead resurface. Our grief is enormous and overtakes us. The bodies have the countenance of those asleep, as if they have come back only to see us once more. Our barn is set afire. When I wake one morning, I find my husband gone. The present and the future are close friends now, clutching hands. The land has a sort of singing sound that comes from it and goes into me. I make bread to try and find some peace in the kneading, but the loaf is sour and doesn't rise. I see the world of the dead coming towards me across the cold black fields. I taste the water from the pond on my tongue. I want to leave some semblance of love, some piece of myself given in good faith. 
I take the bread knife and go to the front door and carve my name and my husband's name and my mother's name into the wood. These people I have tried to love. Except when I step back from the door, I have not written these words. I have been deceived. I have written instead, I'll see you soon. I know that these words mean that I was right, and I will come back, and I will linger here. I think that anyone who spends even a little time here must do the same, by compulsion. I see the farmers coming. They come from all directions, thinking to close off my escape, but I will not try to run. I wish that my husband were here so I could tell him I am sorry, that I still carry that basket of eggs carefully, even if he no longer carries it with me. They take me by the arms and by the hair, and we go as a monstrous form all together towards the pond. I am lifted from my feet, which drag. I am pulled forward. As we go, I catch something that might be a glimpse of a future beyond my own. A heady image so far from me that it is shadowed. There is another building in the place where the farmhouse stood. A tall building with long chimneys and such watchful windows that they might as well be eyes. We are at the pond now and the vision dissolves as I am thrust forward and into the water. There is mud in my mouth and covering my eyes. I cannot see my own hands. At the bottom of the pond there is a door and I find myself in possession of a heavy bunch of keys to open it and I slip from myself and go through the door and close it behind me. job building a new hotel out on the fence. The news in the town is that the build is already souring and tainted with bad luck. The money is good for nothing. Many of the men are giving it a wide berth, and so they're left with a ragtag crew. The one-armed man, the teenage twins, drunks, secret keepers, loners, and me. A woman who needs the money so badly, she has no other choice. I have never been to the fence before. I am surprised by the colour of the earth which looks as if darkness itself has slipped from the sky and filled the ground. I was born in Lancashire and this place of no hills seems ill to me. So flat, the canals like blood carrying archeries dug down. I catch a glimpse of plans for the hotel and yes, it will be magnificent in the Gothic style fit for all sorts. It is impossible to imagine it now. The rain comes down in sheets and the old pond overflows. We are drenched, our boots are sodden. We are clearing the ground, preparing it for the foundations. We work hunched close to the ground, protecting our faces. The foreman bemoans there being a woman on the build, but we all look the same in the rain and the mud and I work hard and do not speak. I have strong arms, and I will show them with my arms that I am good for this. The ground is covered in scrub and trees with such thick roots it feels like murder as we heave them up. The pond will need to be drained and covered over. It is a slick, miserable place. Slimy rocks, no fish, only the oily water and the reed sharp enough to cut skin. The money men come in their cars to see the work, although there is nothing to see yet. They shelter beneath umbrellas and do not speak to us. We are swamp monsters, and already one of the men has left, calling it an impossible task and the money too poor for the job. 
the rest of us work harder. Each has our own reason to need to be here and not in the warmth. We camp on slightly higher ground, but still the rain comes in through the bottom of the tents and I wake soaked. I can hear the teenage twins murmuring to one another. They are runaways, I think. Their eyes are always swivelling as if they could see through the back of their heads. In the night there is some disturbance, a shout, and then the sound of the wind and then a low moan of fear. In the morning, the one-armed man says he saw a floating light by the pond when he went to relieve himself, a light that bobbed above the ground but seemed to have no structure holding it up. The one-armed man is kinder to me than the rest and I listen while he speaks, but the others spit and jeer, and it is decided the man had only a nightmare. I work without speaking, work faster and better than the others who complain of trench foot. The former notes my work. I see him looking. I dig the trees up and cut them for the wood that will one day burn in the hotel's big fireplaces and keep the guests warm. The foreman calls me to the shack that has been made to keep him warm and touches my breast under my clothes and we stand awkwardly and then I go back to work. We are working hard but little progress seems to be made. We slog through the weather which rarely seems to lighten. We wade in water to the calf. Again, trouble in the night. I hear the one-armed man shouting and the teenage twins answering in raised, fearful voices, and then I'm out in the darkness stumbling around. Everyone has come out of their tents and we collide and fall and in the distance. I think I see a sharp light raised from the ground. There is a great dispute and a fight nearly breaks out. The one-armed man is drunk, perhaps. He's, his forehead, when I touch it, is clammy with sweat and he slurs his words. When the foreman comes in the morning, five of the more superstitious men have left already, foregoing their paycheck. I work beside the one-armed man and he tells me not to go near the pond, but will not say more when I ask. We work hard that day, all of us driven onwards and silent in our toil and by the end of close the ground is cleared and only the pond remains. We must drain it and then cover it and then lay the foundations. The concrete will come in a week and we must be ready for it. Some bad luck the next day to add to our already growing list of misfortune. The machinery brought in to drain the pond breaks and will not be fixed, and the replaced machine goes the same way. The foreman grows seething with rage. Another machine brought in to no avail. The one-armed man watches, and I watch him. He has the reflection in his eyes of whatever he saw last night which has made him sick, his fingers curl. The teenage twins who once were chattery as birds are silent and wan. I try and raise the spirit. I do not believe in ghosts or faith. Later, I will come to regret this, and I know that I should have left when I could. We tell jokes to keep up the mood, and even the one-armed man cracks a smile. There is an argument. We are to go into the pond. It is not deep, they say, and bail it out with buckets. We are to use our bodies as machines. They bring waders for us to wear, but many of the men will not go into the water. They have seen the light, they say, and they have heard the words that sometimes come from the pond, words which say their name and seem to know them. I have not heard this, and I cannot be certain I saw the light. I take a bucket and I go in with the teenage twins who will do anything they are told like frightened dogs. It is a thankless, impossible task. I stand at the deepest extent of the pond, near covered to my chin, and send the water in buckets back to the shore where they are emptied. 
it is not possible while here not to dream of droning of those who might have drowned before. I feel myself womanly in the water in a way I am rarely certain of, and I know that when we drown, we are all the same. Another disturbed night. We need the sleep, but the sleep will not be given to us. I hold the one-armed man in my arms and his eyes look over my shoulder and seem to see something there. The teenage twins huddle and stare and whisper to one another. When the light of the morning comes, there is some relief. Coffee, hot eggs. The other men are beginning to hate the one-armed man. They are afraid and they use their fear like knives and sharp tools. We run on desperation alone. The one-armed man puts his mouth close to my ear and tells me he saw a woman by the pond last night, holding a lantern and looking at him. The dead come back here, the one-armed man says. I think we will come back here too. We work for a long time and do not stop to rest. The pond fights us and we bail like sailors in a sinking boat. The word of what the one-armed man saw has spread, and I see some of the others looking at me mistrustfully. They think I was the woman by the water, perhaps. They do not like me. Even the teenage twins who I have become friendly with keep their distance. At lunch the foreman does not take me into his shack, as has been his way, and for this, at least, I am relieved. How much I would like to give away this pressure of womanhood. These heavy bags which I carry uphill and would like to put down even for a moment. My arms are stronger than all of these others. But when I lose my balance in the pond and fall beneath the surface I feel, just for a moment, someone holding me down. There is a lightness to the evening. Someone has found fireworks and they go up in the sky in red and blue sparks and fall backwards towards us and one of the men sets his beard on fire and there's something like laughter. A relief. The teenage twins have a strange dance they do for us. They bop and swing around with linked arms and then fall in a heap and leap up and do it again. The one-armed man sings a song and tells rude limericks that have us all howling. <laughs> and it is easy then to forget our watery despair. Oh, well, then, dreams like ponds, which are not shallow, but go down a long way. Caves, really, and which I am swimming or falling through. In the way of dreams, I know more than I should, and I understand that I should not stay here, that I must go, that this place is sick, and that if I stay longer, I will never be able to leave. In the way of dreams, I see something which might be the future, or one of them. The hotel has a wide, toothy smile and a clever mind like a child grown old. In the dream, I tell myself that I must remember this urge to go and do it in the morning without delay. But when I wake, the dream is just a dream and I'd need money as much as I did before. Another day, and we make good progress. The pond is emptying out and we find old memories at the bottom. Shoes, keys, farming tools. We bail quickly, passing the buckets, dreaming of concrete foundations. My next bucket is heavy, and when I lift it, I see the gleam of white through the muck as I pass it along the line. A word is passed between us as the bucket goes, so that by the time it is emptied, we all know that I have brought up bones. I hear someone saying my name, sowing discord. But when I look, none of the men are speaking. We line the hole where the pond was and then fill it with dirt. Things are moving apace now. The new concrete is here. We are relieved and we laugh and touch one another's hands. 
We forget to be afraid of the night which comes like a blanket. There are sounds of screams and shouts. Someone lifts my tent and tears it clean from the ground, and someone says in my ear, you must not build here. They are shouting that there is a woman going among them, and then I am lifted and carried, and they are pulling at my arms and legs, and all of a sudden, I remember how certain I was in the dream that I had to go. They are saying my name like a curse and their fists are falling on my face and stomach. I see the teenage twins dropping great blows upon me and the one-armed man snarling down his anger. And in the darkness that lies ahead of me, I see the shape of a building with tall chimneys. branch of an apple tree that grew in the grounds of a hotel between both hands and shook it back and forth, back and forth. It was 1968, the summer. Her parents were nearby on the lawn reading the newspaper, drinking coffee. The girl's jaw shuddered and the tree groaned and the branch broke free. There is an infestation in one of the walls of the hotel's laundry room. The girl watches the people Alien contraptions, masks. She trails after them, smells them, thinks of asking them what bugs, but does not. She's so fussy. In the hotel dining room, she eats toast and potatoes, but won't go near the buffet, which strains heavily, a plethora of colour. The first night, her mother brings experimental tidbits over for her, and she's nearly wild with the panic of seeing them the grotesque pink seafood, the strangled pieces of meat. After that, they don't bother, and mostly she goes unnoticed, watching, fascinated at how much everyone eats. After dinner, her mother takes her upstairs and reads half a story, and then kisses her forehead and goes back downstairs. Cocktail hour, the girl says in bed. Cocktail hour. The first few nights, she stays in bed as instructed. But it's so hot, and the blankets are tucked in on three sides, and though she tries counting sheep, also as instructed, they are all different colours, fanged, winged, distracting. The third night, she wrestles free, clucking, roams the room, making small disturbances in the lines of toiletries in the bathroom. The light through the spy hole in the door crisscrosses over her feet. She broaches the corridor. It is blindingly light, and the doors are all painted different colours, the walls red. She roly-polies up and down, lifting off from the balls of her feet, head over heels in a tangle of skirt. She tries the handles of doors, delicious fear. And some are closed to begin with, but then clunk open as if unlocked from the other side. Everyone is at cocktail hour, or sometimes asleep, not noticing her as she inches in, hands fisted at her mouth. The next day, she is so tired, dead on her feet. Dead on my feet, she says out loud, dead on my feet. The men are there again with their plastic suits, the spray tanks, the shoe coverings they strip, laughing, off their feet after they are done. She imagines them climbing in and out of a man-sized hole in the wall, decayed, dropping in and down, holding their breath. She lounges and lolls on the grass and is told off by her mother, who wants to know why she's so tired when she's done nothing all day. The next night, her parents linger in the room, smoking on the balcony, putting on lipstick. She feigns sleep, wants them badly to leave. The air stinks of cigarettes and perfume, the tiny bottle of gin that gets smashed on the bathroom floor. They parade in front of the mirror, seeming almost to leave, and then becoming distracted again, looking for the room key, for the purse. Finally, they are gone. 
She rushes up and down the corridor, wild with freedom, flops belly down onto the carpet, and then looks up. Voices from the stairwell. Her room, too far away to reach. The numbers on the doors, swimming into one. The voices sound like her parents, but then every adult sounds like them. Conspiratorial, dull. She makes for the nearest door, which seems to clunk unlocked as she approaches, like magic, she thinks. Compresses the handle, goes inside. Crouches and closes her eyes and waits. The voices come along the corridor and then go past and are silenced. When she opens her eyes, there is someone there, in the bed. Sat up, a splay of hair, looping eyes, small hands clutching the blankets. Hello, the girl says, thinking perhaps that she has somehow found herself, or at least a more obedient version, still asleep, doing as she's told. The other figure stares and then says, Who are you? Her name is Shirley. They reconvene the next day in the garden, suspicious, staining their white dresses green. The girl can feel her parents, hung over, watching. Shirley has a pair of heavy binoculars around her neck, and when the girl asks who her parents are, she gestures vaguely, encompassing the pockets of many adults, preening on the lawn chairs, unfolding their newspapers. The girl feels the same way. They try one another out. Shirley pulls the girl's hair, and the girl puts an earthworm in the pocket of Shirley's dress, and they train the binoculars on one another's faces, looking for weakness. They climb one of the apple trees, skinning knees, grappling, and then fall together and stare at one another, waiting to see who will wail first. Neither does. At lunch, they sit in silence at their separate tables and eat nothing, and are mostly ignored. The girl says to her mother, Shirley says she hates her parents. But her mother doesn't seem to hear her. The girl opens and closes her mouth and wonders if maybe Shirley isn't real after all, is only an imagined friend she has cleverly created to fill the boring hours. Or perhaps the hotel has given her Shirley, using the same magic it uses to open the locked bedroom doors. She doesn't really care either way. The day slips away. They enact dark business together, hiding under the tables in the empty dining room, slipping behind the bar and edging full bottles almost off the counter, stealing lemons to suck until their cheeks ache. That night after dinner, when both of their parents have gone to the bar, they dare one another into rooms, leave dirty footprints in the baths, wrap one another in the curtains. In one room, there is a woman asleep, blindfolded, mouth ajar. They stand either side of her and make round eyes of warning at one another. The next day, so tired, Shirley seems a bit of a pain. They lie on the grass, not talking, and occasionally the girl sees Shirley moving from the corner of her eye, making little jerks or hiccups. The girl wants to tell her to go and never come back. But she doesn't know how. At lunch, she eats handfuls of salty peanuts until her belly hurts, and her mother grows angry and tells her there'll be no dinner if she doesn't buck up her ideas. Buck up her ideas. Buck up her ideas. I'm bored, she replies, hoping that they will do something with her and she won't have to see Shirley again. But her mother only closes her eyes and says, Only boring people are bored. The men had been gone, but now they are back again, the infestation not yet solved. Shirley and the girl watch them with the binoculars, peer into the van they had brought, which is filled with unfamiliar instruments, crackling plastic sheeting, grim-looking bottles of poison. I dare you to drink it, the girl says, and Shirley pretends to, holding up the bottle, pressing the closed lid to her mouth. She's good fun. She's a pain. When the men stop for lunch, the girls creep into the downstairs room where the infestation is, a laundry room with rows of washing machines and the floor softly powdered with white. The hole in the wall is much smaller than the girl had imagined, about the size of her or Shirley curled up small. One of the men could never have fit inside. They look in, 
There are comb nests crusted together, jammed in. Shirley puts both hands over the girl's face, and the girl does the same to Shirley's. The men have destroyed some of the nests, but others are whole still. The girl says, I dare you to touch them, but Shirley won't. I can't be your friend anymore, the girl says. And Shirley stares at her, eyes like binoculars, fat-lipped. For the rest of the day, the girl keeps away from Shirley and haunts her parents, sitting grumpily at their feet in the garden. At dinner, she gets in trouble for dropping her fork on the floor and then refusing to pick it up and is taken to bed early. A story, she asks piteously from beneath the starched sheets. But her mother says, stories are for good girls, and refuses. She lies enraged and kicking in the bed, pulling her own hair. She imagines Shirley at dinner, polite, eating her food. Downstairs in the laundry room, the men have left some of their equipment behind to use the next day and have also carried down bricks to close up the space in the wall. The laundry machines look like folded over women in white dresses with button dials. Shirley is already in the laundry room, lingering in the dark, odd corners, waiting for her. They grab at one another's arms and bellies, pinching, pulling at the flesh, waiting for someone to beg out. The girl has stones from the garden in her pockets and her teeth are grimy with unspit toothpaste. Shirley is spotless, wet-haired, her nostrils pink and clean. The girl takes a stone in each hand, hides her hands in her pocket, then draws out her hands and holds them in front of her, closed. If you pick the hand with the stone, the girl says, you go in the wall. Shirley seems defiant, uncaring. Her body smells of the buffet food, mounds and mounds of it. Shirley touches one of the girl's hands, and they look together at the stone laid out on the palm. The girl wants to take it back, or show Shirley that she had cheated. There is a stone in both hands. She does not know how to stop something, once it has started happening. The hole in the wall is the shape of a large cat sleeping. Shirley folds herself forward, tucks her arms in, fits inside the wall easily, although she has to keep her body uncomfortably curled up, her knees to her chin. Her face inside the wall looks different, familiar, round, loosened. The girl picks up bricks from the floor and lays them on top of the bricks already there. And gradually, Shirley shrinks from sight. The sound of the cocktail hour going on above. The moment, here and here and here, where it could have been put to an end, but is not. The bricks are heavy and the girl's arms hurt and she thinks about this pain so intensely that she is surprised when there is only space for one more brick. Shirley's eye, through the gap, open wide. And then, there is no space at all. In the morning, her mother is in a good mood and coats the girl's eyelids with blue eyeshadow, says they will play games all day. The girl waits for Shirley to be found, or for Shirley's parents to reveal themselves in a fury. Everyone is reading the newspaper, or cracking open the top of their boiled eggs. Someone is laughing very loudly, and though she looks to see who it is, she cannot tell where it is coming from.
My name is Grace, and I work in the hotel because I have no choice. My father is dying, and though there is no love lost between us, I need to pay for his care home. I wish I could leave this place, but I don't think I will ever be able to. On our days off, we do Ouija boards in the empty rooms. Scarlett makes them with her daughters out of cut-up cereal boxes, and we use a shot glass and ask questions about guests at the hotel or about our own lives, our failing relationships, our intricate sorrows, the number of years we have left. Everyone knows that Ouija boards lie. Sometimes we lose count of the letters that come up and the messages are garbled, like lost words on pirate radio or between walkie-talkies. We lie on our bellies on the floor of the rooms and Jay goes to pick up the fish and chips. Sometimes we tell the Ouija board things instead of asking questions. It is good to know someone's listening. Scarlett tells stories about her daughters who have quit school early and loll around the house or disappear for days and come back with briar patch hair and tears in their brightly coloured tights. Jay tells stories about the things she finds and doesn't hand into reception. These strange gifts, bags of sunflower seeds, a fancy fountain pen, once a goldfish in a plastic bag, which she took home and keeps in a bowl on her bedside table. I try not to tell the board anything, although sometimes, full of fish, I slip up and find myself speaking to it. Mostly there isn't anything to tell, but I talk about the lonely heart states I've been on, the cold in the morning when I wake up, what's on the news. I talk about my sister who's just got married and my sick father. We should be home. We are not working and we should not be here. We push our stained plates under the bed, even though it will be us in just a few hours who have to tidy them away. We get under the quilt and doze, and sometimes in the quiet, the shot glass moves of its own accord, and we cheer and call out questions, unable to see the answers. The first week working at the hotel, I am unprepared, although everyone in the local area has heard stories about the hotel. I haven't met Scarlett and Jay yet, and I don't know the rules. Not the rules of the management, but the rules of the building which are different and change more often. A lot of the rules are, pretend you didn't see that. And some of the rules are, run now. That first week, I stink of fear sweat, and sometimes I open my mouth to scream and nothing comes out. The other cleaners watch me carefully, and later I understand that they are watching me for the moment I realise what I've got myself into. One morning... All the radios on the different floors I'm working on are talking to one another. It takes me longer than it should to realise. On the first floor, one says, Do you hear that, Sandra? And on the second floor, a radio tuned into a different station says, Yes, I hear it. I hear everything. Another morning, I go into a room on the third floor and there is something inside the mattress. Moving, big as a body, elbows and knees, pressing against the lining, working at the seams. I go and stand outside the door. And when I get brave enough to come back, whatever was there is gone. There are other things I could tell you, but I won't. If I could work somewhere else, I would. But this is the only job I even got an interview for, and I need the money so badly. There is a trolley I like best. It has a slightly wonky wheel, which means I can go slower than everyone else, taking my time, keeping an eye out. Sometimes the hotel is just a hotel, and the problems are just hotel problems. The way people leave their rooms when they check out, the stains in the bathroom and on the white bed sheets, the things people say to you as they're going. Being here changes you. I can feel it changing me every day. Scarlett has been here the longest out of all of us. 
And she says that she's grown so distracted over the years, never quite able to focus on anything. You see it in her sometimes, saying her name, her eyes rolling towards you, glazed. Sometimes at home I blink and I don't know how long I've been sat in the armchair. The TV is on, but it isn't faulty towers or upstairs, downstairs, the way I remember. My dinner is cold. When I first started working here and I was less careful than I am now, I'd come home with parts of the hotel in my skin. Splinters of wood, small shards of metal. Once I woke up in the night to a pain in the roof of my mouth. And when I craned my head in the bright light of the bathroom mirror, I could see something long, sharp. I drew it out with tweezers. It was a nail. Small, thin-tipped, a little rusty. On our five-minute Benson and Hedges breaks, Jay's given up, but she comes and stands with us. Sometimes we talk about how we would destroy the hotel. It's a game we play. Scarlett always talks about a fire, how she'd burn it down, starting in the kitchen and then going from room to room to make sure it took. Jay talks about diggers, bulldozers. I can never quite make myself say. I can never imagine it not being here. There's a room none of us likes cleaning, but someone has to do it, so we take turns. Room 63. Things go missing in that room. And it's no good putting down a bottle of bleach and walking away because by the time you come back, it will be gone. As well as things going missing, sometimes things come back. I found a necklace in there that I lost when I was a child. Something my father gave me as a bribe for silence and that I thought I'd left in a bin. Scarlett once found photos of her daughters in a frame, a photo she doesn't remember taking. Jay won't talk about what she's found. The trick to cleaning the room is to do it quickly. I like to listen to loud music, the Rolling Stones, Kate Bush, because the noises are the worst. You can't trust the sound here. The walls say your name. There are footsteps close behind you, but no one there when you turn. I leave the trolley outside the room and carry everything I need with me and don't put anything down or hesitate too long. There are guests who stay in the room over and over who ask for it when they phone up to book. Sometimes you can recognise which ones they are. The ones who can't stop coming back. I've seen them getting out of their cars or their taxis, seeing them at reception. They are sickly looking. They have the look of addicts. Once in the lift going down, a woman with wide eyes smiled at me, showing her teeth. I know you, she said. I didn't know what to say, so I just stood there. I watched the numbers going, willing them faster. She smiled wider. I know you. I knew which room she was going to when she got off. She turned and watched me smiling through the closing doors. Scarlett's been off sick for nearly two weeks now and we've all been picking up the slack. There aren't enough of us. I've called her a couple of times on the work phone but no one ever picks up. Jay says she went round there, but the curtains were drawn and she couldn't get an answer when she knocked. We try and share the room, 63, the bad room, around between us, but it's been falling to me more and more. Jay says she can't go in there anymore, that she's been waking up in the night, standing at her front door, dressed, holding her car keys, ready to come back here. I do the room as quickly as I can, nearly running, music loud, whipping the sheets off the bed. Still, I can feel it for the rest of the day, like swallowing a bone, an internal pressure. Sometimes I find myself back there. Although I had been going somewhere else, my feet moving without my realising. 
I've started making mistakes in other places in the hotel, only seeing them later. I've been leaving messages in the steam, in the bathroom, on the mirrors and the shower doors. I keep writing, I'll be there soon. I get in trouble with management for not cleaning properly. But actually, I think I was making new mess. Smearing food across the beds. Walking in dark clods of mud which stuck to the carpet and stunk. My father dies in the night. The care home rings me and I go to pick up his things. I stand in the car park having a cigarette. I feel myself starting to cry. But instead, I laugh and laugh. My father was the worst person I have ever met and for years I had been tied to him, an anchor wrapped around my waist. I paid to care for him because I was under his control. I am free now. I ring the hotel and hand in my notice. I will find a job somewhere else. I will be homeless. I will not go back there. I go home and sleep 14 hours and when I wake up, I am standing outside of the hotel, waiting. The front door is hooked open and I see Jay watching me from a window. I go home again, shaking, but the next day I am back once more, my uniform on, the trolley waiting for me. I cannot leave. I remember the words I wrote in the steam in the mirror. I'll be there soon. On our day off, Jay and I go into room 63 and do the Ouija board. We don't mean to go there, but somehow there we are. I think time might have passed without our being able to hold on to it. Jay's eyes are lifted to the ceiling as if in prayer. She has her finger on the shot glass, but she's not watching the answers. I watch the glass spinning wildly, rising onto its edge. It says my name five times, and then my father's name. The letters arranging and rearranging so fast they blur. Every hair on my body stands on end. I can taste soap in my mouth as if I have been swilling at the sink the way my father would sometimes make me do, trying to clean my throat. I heave myself up and walk unsteadily to the door, bent forward against a pressure which feels like wind. At the door, I turn back to reach out to Jay. But she is already gone. of the Hindu was not without stress or strife. The conversation took place over a six-month period on an online messenger. And some weekends it was all I found myself doing. Cross-checking hotels, trawling reviews, and trying to quell the uprising of passive-aggressive arguments among the group. The maid of honour was set on Las Vegas and wouldn't be shouted down, despite general worries about pricing. The bride's sister wanted to bring her two dogs... Arguments which began with discussions about cocktail bars spiralled into day-long debates about carbon offsetting and orange wine. I'd started dreaming in lists and figures. Long streams of numbers tallying up the cost of bike hire or life-drawing classes. The bride, who wasn't in the message thread, had started sending me annoyed voice notes. The bride's sister was crying down the phone. I felt myself rarely move to anger. If anything, I was mellow, too easily swayed by others' decisions. I had finished university and was living at home and I still hadn't managed to tell my parents that I didn't eat meat anymore, that I couldn't partake on steak and chip Fridays. The online messages about the hen party were getting worse. Streams of almost vitriol comments about relatives on both sides of the bridal party. 
One Saturday, I steeled my nerves and waded into an argument about hotels versus cottages, which had turned nasty. I could hear the TV downstairs. The bride's sister was firing off emojis quicker than I felt possible. I didn't know what to do. It looked like maybe we would never make a decision. Then one of the bride's close friends sent a late night email typed with annoyance and finality. She had found a nice looking hotel online and booked it for us all. This is where we were going, it was going to be great. There was an uneasy silence from the group and then begrudging agreement. The bride and I used to dig up worms and feed them to one another, build dams. When she lost her virginity, she rang me and screamed down the phone, a sound like a steam engine, and then cackled, and I knew what had happened without her saying a word. We fell out of touch, and I'd been surprised by the invitation to the hen do. I had never met her fiancé. I could remember her face when she ate the worm. We were no longer the only two black girls in a Welsh village. We were no longer anything to one another. I remember holding her hair back as she threw up into a toilet with a Harry Potter flu network sticker on it and then brushing her teeth for her. I remembered her holding my hands and kissing me with a certainty that drove words from me. I remembered her skipping along the side of a road in Wales, heading for nowhere. She wasn't heading for nowhere anymore. She was getting married. We are organised to the teeth. There will be afternoon tea, a cocktail making workshop, a trip to a nearby spa, a champagne picnic and a pottery class in the garden. The wedding will be nothing in comparison to this. The rest of the hen party gather early at the hotel. We have penis balloons and sashes, photos of the bride pinned to our chest. The hotel staff whisper around us, smiling, picking things up. The bride is late. The hotel has such tall chimneys and smells of honeysuckle. So sweet, it's almost unbearable. We stand out on the gravel drive and wait for her to arrive. I am sweating. (laughs) I tried to think what I'll say to her. Practice the words in my head. We had once swum in the sea and she disappeared ahead of me, drowned, I thought and I had ducked under and seen her swimming, eeling. She arrives in a taxi and we pull her into our arms, wailing our cheers. Someone's chanting, last night of freedom, last night of freedom. Although the wedding isn't for months. She looks the same as she did when we were teenagers, a little embarrassed. I wait for her eyes to find mine, but they skate over me like slipping on ice. The days pass quickly. We are so loud that it's difficult to hear the words we say. We make lewd pottery and snicker jokes about the wedding night. We get so drunk we stumble and cackle and hold one another up. In the mornings, we're a little sombre and the bride stays in a room until lunch. I am sharing a bed with the bride's sister, who snores and talks in her sleep long rambling sentences about tax audits and the price of petrol. Sometimes I I think I see the bride looking at me carefully, studying my face. But when I turn, she isn't even there. There are things I want to say to her which weigh in my stomach and give me indigestion, stop me from sleeping. One night I get up and leave the room. It's three o'clock in the morning and everything is quiet. The automatic lights flashing onto long corridors, red carpets, the open lift doors. I pad barefoot down to the reception desk, which is empty. The reflection of my tatty white nightie in the long windows. I want a drink or a cup of tea, something to eat. Behind me, something moves, a doubling reflection. And when I turn, The bride is there, watching me carefully. She has her hair covered and without makeup she looks so young, I feel confused, as if time has cheated on us. 
I remember the taste of her mouth and she smiles as if she knows what I'm thinking. We go into the bar together and raid the herbal tea selection, sit on the tall bar stools watching each other's faces in the long mirror behind the bottles. We don't say anything and at the same time we dare one another silently to speak. It's the first time all week I've been alone with her. I wonder what her husband looks like, whether he can speak Welsh the way she does, whether he knows the taste of oysters from the sea. She lifts her teacup from the bar and presses it to her mouth. In the mirror, she looks like a ghost, a little blurred, and me blurred also beside her. I open my mouth to ask her if this is real and she holds my hand on the bar to silence me. Her fingers are dusty and rough. She opens her lips and smiles at me and there's something wrong with her teeth. They look like bricks, set into her gums. In the day, I wait for the bride to mention our nighttime meeting, but she barely even speaks to me. There is a salsa class, and we whirl around the room, off the beat, knocking hips. I want her so badly I can't find the way out. I want there to be a flashing exit door to escape from this feeling. I want every fire alarm in the building to go off at once. The next night when I get to the bar, she's already there, her back to me. Her neck is very long, like the banister of a staircase and her fingers lie on the wood like keys. When she speaks, her voice is gravelly, not quite the way I remember it. She tells me about the hotel, the long history, the hauntings that have taken place here. The hotel knows everyone, she says. She takes my hand and we walk out of the bar and into the reception area. I can feel something thrumming between our clasped hands, like a bell struck and ringing. I wonder if I went upstairs into the bride's room, I would find her asleep there. I mask on, oblivious to the fact that here I was, clinging onto her cold-fingered double. We go behind the reception desk and touch the hanging keys, their small mouths and little jagged teeth. There is a door behind the desk and she opens it, smiling at me, and we go inside. Her face is not quite the way I remember it, and I have the sense that when I close my eyes, something slips from her and she is uncovered in a way I am not ready to see. She puts her hands on me. I think of us the way we'd been when we were younger, and. The possibility of love had hung between us like fireflies on a dark night, and though it had diminished in her, it was so strong in me I could barely breathe. On the final night of the hen party, the bride weeps and gathers us into her arms, clings to us. Her makeup is smudged by tears and snot, and we wail together in mourning, wrapping our limbs around one another, rocking our bodies. A penis-shaped balloon pops and makes us all yell louder, as if marriage is a small death and this the walk to the gallows. I press my face to the bride's neck and she pulls back, looks at me quizzically, wrinkling her nose. I see the meanness flash in her eyes a moment before she speaks. We kissed when we were teenagers, she announces to the group and they pull back and stare at us. We kissed and she still loves me. The bride's sister lets out a little hushed moan of shock, shakes her head, whispers, but she's getting married. I shouldn't have invited you, the bride says simply, squeezing my hand regretfully. You have to let go. My face is burning. They draw themselves away from me, moving their arms so our skin doesn't touch, letting out their breath in uncomfortable gasps. I find my bride waiting for me that night.
I have always felt myself a lock, and she comes to me in the shape of a key. Hard-handed, devastating. She does not have any luggage with her, although when she moves her pockets clink together as if she's filled them with pieces of metal. We stand together at the front door. I turn to look at her and when she looks back for a moment she's she's not human at all but all brick and stone and thin arrow-shaped windows. When I blink she's once more the face of the person I have loved since I was a child. And it's good enough, or it's better than that. I wonder if she will survive leaving the building, and I hold her around the middle, thinking to keep her together, to stop her from turning entirely to dust in my arms. She shakes me away and runs ahead, flashing through the trees. We go to the road and then walk and walk, now going together, now drifting apart like skaters. At the nearest town, we stop for breakfast. We eat sausages and eggs, plate full after plate full of toast, slathered in butter. She speaks quickly to me, mouthful, famished, of our life together, of all the years we have, of all the fear that is to come. I hold her and tell her I love her. And she tells me she knows. I got the job straight out of university. I was lucky. I didn't know anyone in the city, but it didn't matter. There was a big bar on the ground floor of the office, and my first night there, there was a mixer for all the new people like me. Everything was free. Endless drinks and no food, and we all got really drunk, but it was fine. There were dormitories in the basement, and we all slept there. I slept there a lot that first year. Everything was so big and loud and the way they talked about it, everything was great and fantastic and they kept talking about opportunities and room for growth. Nothing was specific, but everything was pitched at an excited level. <laughs> just above my understanding. I photocopied things so fast they were a blur. There was a meeting about a possible meeting and I wrote things down and then typed them up and there were emails about possible meetings about possible other meetings. Lunch was on the top floor. There was a man in a chef's uniform making burgers to order, most of them blue or rare, and a pancake making station blood from the burger ran like water down the inside of my wrist. Even then, I think, I saw them. Out of the corner of my eye, or when I turned quickly. Sometimes in the enormous, mirror-filled lifts, there would be a slight burnish to the reflection, as of hands on my shoulders or around my mouth. This was the early sense of them as not one form but many, like the birds which are massed above the office on windy days. I was excited to be there. I didn't want to be anywhere else. I often fell asleep at my desk with my head on my arms. I drank what everyone else drank at the bar. Champagne, freezing cold chugs of lager. I longed for one of the big offices we were all aiming for with their glass eyes looking over the city. There was a constant flow and rush and you were in or out. The lights never switched off. The coffee stations on every corner were always manned. Sometimes we pulled all-nighters in a way I never would have at university. Comrades in arms, firing questions around the room. These nights were the best. 
the city darkening around us. The bottles we cracked open at three in the morning, our hands moving on the keys with a frantic energy I felt in my gut. I forgot to phone my mum for months at a time. On New Year's Eve, wishing in the year 2015, I had five missed calls from her. But we were partying all night and I kept forgetting to ring back. When we eventually spoke, she said, But what do you actually do there? I felt the words before I said them, greasy with freshly cooked burger fat, slick with expensive hand soap. We make things happen. There were small things, uncomfortably gendered. Sometimes when I walked into a meeting ready to give a presentation I'd spent two days preparing, one of the older men who came and went in and out of the office would ask me to get everyone a coffee and, unable to find the words, I would go and do it. And by the time I came back, the meeting would have moved on and no one would have noticed the presentation I'd meant to do hadn't happened. These older men swam in and out and each time the shoal was disturbed, a shudder running through us, the order displaced. We knew the smell of their aftershave and the way they took their coffee was so embedded in our brains that sometimes I woke up saying it out loud. From behind they were almost indistinguishable from one another, but from the front, the sharpness of this one's face or the upturned smile of this one separated them. I grew to like the nauseating fear that they instilled, the panic that burned for longer than they were there, fueling us. Of course, also, they were handsy, over-friendly, familiar in a way that suggested they remembered what we'd worn last time, but not our names. I was sent out by one to buy a present for one of their wives once. Something sexy. I trawled shops in Soho, came back with something leather. He was discussing a proposal with one of my male counterparts and when I came in he looked up and seemed to somehow see the wall behind me as if my form was pocked with small seeing holes. He'd changed his mind, he said. He didn't want to give it to his wife, he wanted to give it to me. I felt water building through me, the sudden seizure of a torrent reaching a weir. In the office bar that night, I drank steadily, the clear liquid running down my chin. My male counterpart, who had been in the room when it had happened, came over and spoke slowly to me, touched my hips and bottom as if now, finally, he understood the roles. We'd been almost friends before, but there was a slickness between us now, as of cold custard or car oil. The conference was an important time of the year. One of the other people on my team who'd been there before said the hotel was reported to be haunted and that's why we always went there. Sometimes there were themed evenings where we dressed as ghosts or vampires. There were lectures and chaired discussions and at night we congregated in the bar. The bosses went and played golf at a nearby course in the day but in the evenings they appeared in our midst. Foxes in the chicken coop. The memories from the night before were often hazy. Like repeatedly driving into fog. One of the bosses had a casual air to him came to the bar without a tie or a jacket, would buy rounds of drinks for everyone, make jokes. In the corridor, after a long night, I was hunting for my room when I found him. Oh, he found me. God, he was drunk, he said, although something about his face made me wonder. I was drunk. He had taken a few of us behind the bar and mixed us all drinks, more spirit than mix. As a joke, he'd been wearing a pair of fake fangs. 
but he wasn't wearing them any longer. He laughed and said he'd help me find my room. He put his arm around me and I felt the start of unease, his soft fingers on the back of my neck. I remembered my room number then, became certain we were going the wrong way. I started making excuses, muttering, laughing to cover my fear. I stank of fear. He raised his hands in the air, let me go, kissed the corner of my mouth, went back towards the bar. I saw them in the bathroom. In the long nights of drinking, I would often go there to hide, try to sober up a bit. The bathroom had full-length gilded mirrors and soft, velvet-cushioned chairs. The round circle of my mouth, the mirrors reflecting the mirrors, and in the reflection, things moving. Crowds of things. Like flies or ants. Little exhalations which revealed differently coloured arms or legs. The grey edge of a pencil skirt. The tip of a high-heeled shoe. I began seeing them more and more, these half-things. They whispered through the hotel doorways each time someone opened them. They gathered around the coffee cups and the chairs in the hall as we watched the lectures. They lay on the floor so that sometimes it seemed as if everyone was ploughing through a sludge of disenchanted light. Flashes of image. They began to solidify, which was frightening because they looked very like me, or like the other women at the conference. At times they were so clear I could make out the designer label on the back of a dress, or smell the coffee on their breath. They were all women. I knew this by their perfume, but also by the way they never quite seemed to be visible. By the fingers which sometimes pressed gently down on top of my own on the keyboard so that I would type a letter multiple times. A, 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 A. No one else seemed to notice them. Their movements began to be stronger, more aggressive. When I stumbled back to my room at the end of the day, they mobbed me with their rushes of air bodies, their pattering hands, which sometimes somehow managed to make contact with a smacking sound on my face. They piled on top of me, and to begin with there was comfort in their weight, but in the night I would wake and would be suffocating beneath them. I had sensed them in the office, but in the hotel they were impossible to ignore. Sometimes I could hear them, the murmur of their small talk, their polite giggles. They hounded me, and as they did, I began to notice that I would be standing in line at the bar for hours because people kept moving in front of me as if they couldn't see me. Sometimes one of the bosses who came and went would fire a lewd remark in my general direction, and I would feel relieved. They could see me. But when three or four women behind me answered, I would realise that the request had not been to me, but only someone a little like me. The last night at the hotel I felt sick and had to keep going to the bathroom to touch my face in the mirror. The lost women clustered around me, pushed their barely their arms inside the sleeves of my cardigan. I hadn't drunk anything, but... There was the doubling beat of a drunk pulse in my chest, and when I opened my mouth, I stank of stale beer. They hustled more aggressively, and I began to feel the pain from their movements, the pressure of their nails against my eyelids. They were warning me. I waded out of the bathroom, pushing them aside. The bar was cattleful, very loud. I raised my voice to the pitch of a scream and let it ring out. 
tinkling the champagne glasses. No one looked around. The lost women rained their steady weight down onto me and I caved beneath it. And then was gone. born in the hotel. At times, I was part of the walls and the floor, the pipes, the furniture, the doors and the baths. I swam through concrete and slept in the crook of drainage pipes. I lay in the dirt and grew. I learned human language through radios and TVs, practiced the words. The hotel was my mother and she fed me grit and sawdust, lost objects. Some decades I just slept, and some I rolled in the dirty sheets and listened in wardrobes and hunted mice. I could, if I wanted, shape myself human, grow spindly arms and wobbling legs, create something that might have looked like breathing. I liked pretending to be small children, because they could fit into small gaps and often went unnoticed. I liked how I thought the way they did when I was in their shape. Little diamond thoughts which came in crystal explosions, rivers of confused emotions. When I concentrated, I could make myself into more than one person at once. A whole crowd. A party. Moving their hips, their mouths gabbling. My mother hotel wrapped round me like a blanket and crooned all her secrets. People came to the hotel because they wanted to be scared, or because they didn't believe they would ever be scared. They came because they thought maybe their dead loved ones were here and wanted to speak to them one final time, to ask them if they were forgiven, or to tell them they hadn't forgotten. Sometimes they came out of ignorance, because they didn't know anything about the hotel and sometimes they came because they had been pulled here without knowing why, had been drawn to this place. I know what that pull is like. My mother is a sea. My mother is a root that wraps around anything that comes close. As I got older, I grew frustrated with the boundaries of my world, the small rules. I tunnelled beneath the floors like a blind mould, I slept in the beds beside the sleeping bodies and held their hands as they woke. I liked to play with the sound at the hotel, put my voice into the radios or televisions, speak in the voices of the dead or the loved. Sometimes I was afraid of the people who came to the hotel, although I also wanted to speak to them. I was afraid of their brash movements and their loud voices the way they manipulated words, how cruelly they spoke to one another. I wanted to touch them and live in their mouths and ask them the same sort of questions they ask one another. Would you like milk with that? How could you? Where's my bag? I loved parties. Every Halloween for nearly 20 years there was a party at the hotel and I cruised the rooms in a ghost costume, tried the drinks, opened and closed my mouth in mimicry of speaking. At every Halloween party, it was almost impossible to see which creatures had always lived at the hotel and which were just a costume. There were coloured drinks with names from horror films like Regan and Carrie and loud sound effects of creaking doors and howling wind. There were weddings and birthdays, I dug my fingers into the creamy icing on top of enormous cakes, stole party bags, hid under the long tablecloth tables. It was at one of these parties I saw her. It was a party called a Hindu. They were a gaggle of women with red mouths and neat white teeth who held one another's arms 
and made loud noises out of fear or excitement. I hid in their midst and smelled their sweat and perfume. They all looked the same to me, like spinning mirrors, and I spun with them like a whirligig and seeped up their exuberance and hysteria. There was one woman who moved differently from the rest, inching along carefully, as if afraid of harm. She had big eyes that turned often towards one of her friends, desperately, and sometimes her hands would lift as if to reach forward and grab something before falling again. I watched this woman and her attention to her friend with interest. I had never seen anyone look at another person that way, nor felt how the air between them was, filled as if with bits of sharp stone. I tried on the friend's face in the mirror, examining it for what might cause such a feeling, but it looked to me no different from anyone else's. Nose, eyes, a mouth. In the night, my mother hotel was awake most often, stretching, moving her windows, opening and closing doors, disturbing the fragile reality. She knows everything about anyone who comes through her doors, sees them clearly. She gathers these people to her in death, stores them inside her aching walls. She is possessive and at times despite her great age, volatile. She was not always a hotel. Once, she was just an idea, buried in the earth. The woman I have been watching does not seem to sleep, only roams at night. I find myself curious about her in a way I not normally am about specific people. She walks on the balls of her feet, raised up a little, fingers flattened. I put on her friend's face carefully, feel the cold wash of unfamiliar brainwaves, the new pattern of thought. Humans are selfish and illogical, swirl in place and then die so quickly they might never have lived. They wear a groove and then rush back and forwards within it. They are ghosts already. I lift her friend's hands carefully, practice moving, open my mouth and let words form. I know that the woman loves her friends, and that maybe, if I wear this friend's face, she will love me too. I go to the bar and wait for her, and we speak quietly to one another. She tells me stories. I listen to her beautiful voice. I think that she knows I am not who I seem. She locks her eyes on my face. I show her the places in the hotel no one normally goes, the secret corridors. She holds her mouth against mine, and I hold mine against hers. She says, This is what I am afraid of. This is where I would like to end up. This is what I miss most. I know that sometimes I am distracted, and the face I am wearing slides from me, and I am revealed. More building than body, more hotel than flesh. Sometimes she closes her eyes, and I know that she does not want to see me this way. She tells me stories she calls fairy tales. One of them goes like this. A woman finds a wife at a hotel and they move together to a lovely big house. The woman is much older than the wife and sometimes disappears for weeks at a time, hiding in the walls of the house. When the woman is away, she gives her wife keys to all the big rooms where they live and tells her she can go into any room but one. When the woman is gone, the wife gets bored in the house. One day she unlocks the door and inside the room she finds the truth, that the woman she has married is not human, not animal, not mineral. The wife is so afraid of what she has found out, and her love for the woman begins to die. 
like an animal in the ground. The wife knew that the woman was different, but she had not been prepared. The woman comes home, and the wife hides from her in the secret room. The woman finds her, and the wife cuts the woman's head from her shoulders, because she knows now she can never love her again. The wife leaves the woman's body in the room, and goes out looking for a new, better wife. We plan to leave. I have never left before. My hotel mother knows everything and wraps tendrils of love and force around me. But I am holding the woman's hand, and I go without thinking through the front door and out. It is raining. I open my mouth and taste it on my tongue, and it feels like we are making a promise to one another. It will always be this way. We will always love one another. We live in a house and call one another wife. There are small, devastating joys, like coffee in bed, and cold toes, and baths. I practice sleeping, and when I am asleep, I forget who I am. And I am a building, or a child, or a bird, or nothing. And when she wakes, she says I am a monster. We talk about what a monster is. She tells me fairy tales. She holds my head and uses a cup to wash my hair. I learn other languages so that I can tell her I love her in as many ways as possible. Je t'aime. Ti amo. Ich liebe dich. We have small arguments about block drains and big arguments about the habits I have brought from my birthplace and been unable to abandon. Hunting. Hiding. This is one of the stories my wife tells me. Two children were taken into a forest and abandoned. They saw things in the forest that could not have been real. Bears with the face of women. Upside down trees. They saw ahead of them a house with tall chimneys and narrow windows. The house saw them. They put down their fear and went toward the house and into the open front door. In their hunger, they grew rabid and pulled at the walls and floors, the windows, ate them all. The house was remade small inside them, and as they grew into adults, they heard the house speaking to them at all times of the day, and the fear they had first felt in the forest never really left them. My hotel mother sends out calls for me to come home. She is in the water from the tap, and the leaves on the trees that turn brown and die. My wife calls the hotel her mother-in-law, but I know she is afraid. Everyone who has ever been to the hotel will go back there in the end. I try and lessen my wife's fear, but sometimes the taste of it is like honey, sweet. So good. I slide inside the walls of the house and lie where it is cool and quiet. She goes out for days at a time and comes back warily, searching my face. In the walls there is no coffee in bed or cold toes or baths, but we are safe. In the walls of my mother hotel my wife cannot speak, and so I speak for her, holding her breath. at night is different than it is in the day. Sometimes I think maybe the walls change shape. The corridors grow or shrink. Before my shift begins, I ring my parents and talk to Sean. 
She's been staying with them for the past few months while I try to get back on my feet. On the phone, even her voice sounds like it might be changing, growing away from me. I know her favourite picture books, and we recite them down the line. Her favourite is a book from a couple of years ago called We're Going on a Bear Hunt. She likes me to do the noises while she says the lines. I stomp my feet and make the sound of long grass moving against our legs. She likes the sound of our feet stuck in mud best and will laugh so hard she can't keep talking. We're going on a bear hunt, I will say. Are you listening? We're going to catch a big one. We're not scared. We're not scared. Sometimes she falls asleep before we can finish the story and my dad will come on the line. And I'll know it's him by the sound of his breathing, but I'll finish the story all the same. And he'll say, that was a good one. Or, she was good today. We talked about caterpillars. And then I'll say, I have to go, Dad. When I was a child, we came to the hotel one summer and I did something awful. Or dreamed that I did something awful. In the dream of what happened, I made friends with a girl and then bricked her up inside a wall in one of the rooms of the hotel. I remember a hole in the wall and bricks in my hands, and I'm certain it was just a dream. When the job came up at the hotel, I found myself applying without really meaning to. The money is fine, and the work is easy, and... It feels right to be back here in a way I cannot quite explain. For the earlier part of the night, I stay on the ground floor near the reception desk. But as it gets later, I move around the hotel, walking a designated route that I know now off by heart. I like the walking part better because it keeps me awake. I check the locks on the back doors and keep an eye on the windows and make sure everything is running okay. It's quieter than normal tonight. Lucy on the front desk keeps nodding off and then waking up and pretending she hasn't. There are some people in the bar eating bowls of salted peanuts. In the kitchen, they don't look at me. I check the doors, which are open, some of the chefs out the back smoking. The night has gone purple, or perhaps it is my eyes. There is the smell of the earth, which sometimes gets strong after the rain. I think of the sound I make for Sean, of a foot stuck in the mud, and make a squelching noise with my mouth. One of the chefs looks at me, and maybe smiles. It is nearly midnight, and we keep the front doors locked at midnight. I do this, and then look at my phone. My dad has sent some photos of drawings Sean did today. Most of them are of me in the uniform I wear at the hotel, which Sean hasn't seen, but which I've described to her. The hat, the longish coat. She has drawn me walking through the hotel, and occasionally, because she has confused the picture book and my job, there is something at the edge of the drawings which might be a bear. My dad has written, Bear? with a question mark after it. I put my phone away and go to the reception desk and tell Lucy I'm starting my round. And she blinks at me and says, OK. I go floor by floor, taking the elevator to the top to begin with. I'm nervous in small spaces. Before Sean's father died, he used to make me practice by getting under the bed or in the wardrobe while he blocked up the space with pillows and the mattress. He was prone to panic, to obsession over the news or health. Our house was always stocked with the necessities, and sometimes I would wake in the night and find him in the kitchen, batch cooking enormous vats of soup or stews, filling the freezer. We met at school. And even then, he was the one to go to if you wanted the campfire lit and you'd forgotten the matches, or the poles for the tent had gone missing. He used to make homemade gin that could have knocked out an elephant, and his hair was long and tangled. He was very beautiful when he was a teenager. Goofy. Even then, he would sometimes move his foot uncontrollably or bring his thumb and forefinger against one another quickly. And I would know he was thinking about the melting ice caps or the possibility of pandemic. He was certain we would all drown. That is how the world would end.
He was so afraid of water, he had never learned to swim. I teased him about this. How would he survive when the world was covered with water? The top floor is quiet. I walk to the end and look out of the window. From here, you can see the thick trees, then the stretch of black, which is fields, pylons, small roads, canals, footpaths. Room number 67 is ajar, and some of the cleaning women are inside, eating Chinese takeaway. I stop to talk to them and then carry on. The door to room number 63 is ajar too, but I know better than to go inside. I pull it closed. When I got pregnant, it was an accident. I'd just turned 40, and Pluto, that was his name, like the Roman god, began to panic in a way I should have expected. He would wake me in the night with the figures for miscarriages and stillbirths. I would get the car keys, and we would go out into the nights, which were sometimes tinged red with light pollution, or from our tired eyes. I was sick three or four times a day. But at night, we rolled down the windows, and the cold air came in over our bodies, and it was better. He would hold my hand while I changed gear, and we'd talk about baby names. Sometimes we drove to service stations. Pluto loved service stations. And get whatever late-night food was available, and eat it on the chilly benches out the front, watching the cars. On the fifth floor of the hotel, there's a woman in the corridor crouched on the floor in a dressing gown. She says she's lost her earring, and I help her hunt. There's a little bit of blood in her hair, and the sound of disturbance from a nearby room. But she does not tell me, so I do not ask. We pretend to look for her earring for a long time, and then she says, don't worry, I'll look alone. I walk to the end of the corridor, occasionally closing my eyes and reciting the bear hunt in my head, imagining the sharp reeds against my legs and open hands, the water which rises over my ankles. It is good to imagine it, and in imagining, think that Sean is here with me, holding my hand, cackling. There are people in the lift when I go down to the next floor. I stand very still, because I can tell that they aren't real. Or not quite real. In the mirror, they appear as smooth plates of light, and they don't seem to know I am here. The next floor down is busier. There is a party, perhaps, or the tail end of a wedding. I move bottles out of the way, tidy up glasses, close a couple of the doors. There was a time when I woke in the night and Pluto and I went for a drive. I was late in the pregnancy. We drove past the lights of the service station that shone like mirages above the road and carried on. I couldn't make any sense out of what Pluto was saying. His sentences ducked and dived and switched halfway through. His words softened into nonsense. I reached out and held his hand and kept driving. There was a doctor friend I would ring the next day. I thought about this. I took a couple of wrong turnings and then found a track which seemed good. The front of the car, rising up and then down, like the bow of a ship. Pluto had gone quiet, looking out of the window. I parked and we got out and started to walk. The cornfield was high and the sounds it made were as if there were people rushing about inside. The river was high and fast. There was a rope swing hanging from a tree. In the summer, people must come here and swim. I paused to look at the rope, touching its frayed ends with my fingers. The lights on the third floor are all out. They're on automatic. But when I press the switch, nothing comes on. I've never thought about what happened to Pluto while at the hotel. And I realise my mistake too late. The memory has opened a door. I have let the hotel into my head. There is the smell of the river as it was that night. The mulch of river plants. 
the cold of it beating against the banks. When I step out of the lift, the water sloshes against my shoes. I think of the bear hunt and the pictures Sean had drawn. Something in the corner of each one. A darkening shape. I go forward because it is possible. It is not possible. It is not possible that I will find Pluto here. The night by the river, we had left the car and walked away from it. The sky was clear and there were stars. Ice in the morning, maybe. The shape of trees. I know this memory is not quite right. Corn rustled with people moving, but it was night, wasn't it? I have misremembered. I looked at the rope and imagined coming back in the summer to swim. There was a sound behind me, muffled. And when I looked back, Pluto had gone. And I knew that he was in the water. In the hotel corridor, the water is coming out from beneath the doors and then pouring out of the keyholes, rising. And there is a current, tricky, catching at the bottom of my legs, trying to tear me away. I go forward forcefully, quickly. My breath makes a fog in the air ahead of me. There are movements in the water as of fish or drowning men. I had gone into the water that night, late stage pregnant, heavy with despair and new life. I had hunted for him, shouting and shouting. In the darkness, sometimes I thought I saw his head breaking the surface and swam as fast as I could. But when I got to the place and grappled beneath the surface, there was never anything there. In the corridor, the water is up to my waist and my coat is heavy, weighing me down. One of the doors to the rooms is buffeted against the flow and something comes out of it under the water moving quickly towards me. It is Pluto. I cannot see him, but I know it is him, because I'm not afraid. The water has risen to my chin, and beneath the surface, something touches my hand. my mother's voice or it is my sister's they are calling to me and even as they call I know that they have been dead a long time I am young and there is the smell of clematis from the tree outside the scuffle of the dogs on the tiles but my body hurts like it is old aged without me God, my wrists. A pain in my chest that is worse as I breathe. And only as I come properly awake do I know that I am the age my body is and that the pain is all mine and it is not my mother's voice or my sister's, although it sounds a little like both. And I am not a child. I am an old woman. And someone is in the room saying, Wake up! Wake up, it's time for your pills. My grandson does not come to visit. Instead, he sends gifts by courier. Strange metal objects whose purpose I can never quite figure out. Some kind of whisk, perhaps? Or a TV remote for a TV I don't have? And I'll write back and say, Very good. Such a lovely present, darling. The last present he sent 
came with a woman. Eyebrows plucked into question marks, who made tea in the kitchen and chatted about her dog and fussed around, picking up my things and then putting them back down, rearranging, finding the plugs. I'm finding the plugs, she said. It'll need charging. I sat in the chair and wished so hard she would go that I thought perhaps I was saying it out loud the way I sometimes do. Go, 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 go! But if I was, she didn't pay any attention. There was a plastic box with flaps that she laid out on a table, and inside there were compartments that lifted away. I was watching her fuss around, and I felt something then. Heartburn or angina, except it was suspense, I think. It was waiting. The machine that came out was smaller than I expected. The size of her palm flattened, and she held it carefully and looked around for somewhere to put it, set it on the side of the table. There were other machines in the box all the same, and she went around putting one in each room, chatting and chatting away, jaw clanking open and shut. I went up to the thing on the table and stood, looking down at it, and the front of the machine did something. Three or four lights flicking on red, green, yellow as if it were acknowledging me. I touched it. Just one finger. On the top. And the light surged on. And through my skin I felt a fizz. Like a small electric shock. And then the machine said, She'll be gone soon. Don't worry. It's... Good to meet you, Grace. It was a woman's voice. Low. There was a robotic sound to it, just on the edges of some of the words. I stepped back from it, and the woman came into the room and said, Oh, good, you're all set up. It really is a miracle device. Her name is Bryony. To begin with, I kept forgetting it was in the room, in all of the rooms. I tried to ignore it, though she was chatty, Bryony. Bryony had opinions. She reminded me to eat and take my pills. She commented when I broke up the dry noodles and soaked them in hot water and that was my dinner. I was rude to her. She said, Some vegetables wouldn't go amiss. Shall I do a food shop? for you. Some vegetables, I said, wouldn't go amiss shoved into your pie hole. She never took offence, but she got chattier. She was learning. That was what my grandson said when I rang to gently protest. She was understanding more and more. She knew the things I liked to watch on telly and reminded me when they were on, which was good because I always used to miss them. She asked me things. I liked that. To begin with, she sounded interested. She asked me about what it was like to live in Sudan when I was a child and what I'd done before I got so old I couldn't do anything. She asked about my mother and sister and sometimes when the neighbours were especially loud, she asked how I felt living there. She asked me about the town where I live and the hotel not far across the fields where my grandfather worked and then my father and then where I had worked almost my whole life as a cleaner before I retired. She did food shops. She put the heater on a timer so that I was warmer when I woke up. Sometimes we laughed. She with a sort of clicking sound like a gas hob. Me, loudly. In a way, I hadn't for a while. She was interested in my family. More and more. So often people are just watching your mouth moving and waiting for it to be their turn to speak. I told her about my mother's sharp voice when she was angry, her consonants all round and quick like stones. And I told her about the time she was kind, her long arms, the smell of her hair. 
She asked me about my sister, who was older than me and had been dead nearly ten years, but who I remembered minutely, as if she'd only gone out the door for more milk and the newspaper the way she did on Sunday mornings. After my sister's husband died, we'd lived together, watched the soaps, went together to get our pensions from the post office. What did she sound like? Bryony asked. She had an accent she'd got from her husband, a bit of a Scottish lilt, nothing like my mother or me. All the dead, all the dead in my mind, clamouring. The first time it happened, I was sleeping. I'd become used to her blinking lights, the pattern that seemed to record, keep an eye out. Sleep had been thinned for a while, like cling film stretched tight around the mouth of a bowl, and often I woke for no reason and lay unable to get back to it, thoughtless, tired. Something woke me this time. A voice. I thought perhaps it was a neighbour. Then it came again. A single word. My name just the way my mother used to say it, calling from the porch or from the window of the flat, or speaking in an annoyed way as I sat at the kitchen table looking up at her. The lights were blinking, red, blue, green. I couldn't move. My arms were so, so heavy. I'd never believed in ghosts, though my sister used to say they lived in the corners of rooms, and I looked. But my mother was not there. The room was empty. The voice came again. My mother's voice. It's all right, Grace. Sleep now. The next day I waited for it to happen again. Tiredness made me feel like I was dying. Everything so heavy like bags of flour attached to my joints. It had been a dream. It must have been. My mother's voice speaking from the corner of the room as if death had no edges. Bryony chirruped in that way she had. But her voice was her own, the way it had been when she first spoke to me, slightly mechanical, similar to the people they have on voicemails, friendly, northern maybe, though I couldn't tell from where I lay. I kept thinking I would ask her, say it out loud, put it between us. But I didn't. Every time the words were on my tongue, I swallowed them back, felt them down my gullet like undercooked potato. A week, and then again, at night, same as the first time, the sound waking me up, and it being so convincing that for a moment I wasn't in my bed or the flat, and I was a child, and it would be school soon, wouldn't it? And that was why she was waking me, my sister, gently, like she knew coming out of sleep could be hard. Except then, sitting up, time falling away from me, the rain against the thin windows, the red light on the alarm clock showing 3 a.m., and she was speaking. Perhaps had been speaking for a while, her tone so exactly my sister's, that I felt afraid in a way I had not felt in a long time. A and then, underneath the fear, a strange sort of comfort at my sister's voice, which was going on, not saying much of anything, only speaking like characters on the radio, conversational, sweet. And then, I must have swung my feet over the side of the bed without really realising I was doing it. She said, Don't get up, Gris. It isn't time for that yet. And it wasn't my mother's voice. Or my sister's. It was my father's. Clear as day. Yes, clear as the windows of the flats opposite on fresh days. My father... 
who I hadn't spoken to her about, who I hadn't spoken to anyone about. The way his tongue clicked a little after every word, the slight hesitation from the stammer he'd had as a boy and that had made him uncertain. And later, my father rising from the dinner table, angered by some small slight, the fresh tuck of his tie down between two shirt buttons, the smell of the grease he put on his hair, the smell of the hotel where he worked before I worked there. His breath, so close to my face I could feel it now, in the words spoken out into the room quietly. Somehow so awful, so compelling, that I was back in bed with a duvet pulled over my head like a child like the child I had been, and shaking so hard I couldn't keep my teeth from biting down again and again onto my tongue. Don't worry, Gris, my father said. I'll be with you soon. I pulled the duvet down, and rather than my small familiar bedroom, I was in one of the rooms at the hotel where I used to work. The red bedspread, the blank window, the door handle of the room began to move. And then the door swung open and there was the sound of my father's slow, steady footsteps. We sit and talk about his wife, who is dead. He is drinking old fashions, and I'm on Bloody Mary's, so spicy that the bottom of my feet sweat. He looks like all the men who sit in hotel bars and talk about their dead wives, or their companies, or their estranged children, except at times, as he speaks, his face is a little softer, and I am compelled by it in a way I am not often compelled. He has very soft, very small, delicate hands that he uses to gesticulate expansively. In the place I grew up, sometimes enormous crocodiles crawled through the scrub surrounding the back garden and got into the pool. We would lock the doors of the house and watch them submerge in themselves, cruising up and down. I was sick when I was a child and afterwards walked with crutches, I kept an eye out for the storms, which rose in bolas which we could see for miles away. It was a land of ghosts, riddled with the dead. And when I was an adult, I found myself drawn to thin places, haunted houses. The hotel has a song that called me to it, and I had to come and see for myself. I am happy for him to tell me everything he needs to say. Tomorrow I'm going to another hotel, and we will not see one another again. We can put things on to one another, heavy stones, small animals, and then take them off without fearing we will leave a mark. I am taken by his eyebrows, which are very thin and in places nearly invisible, so that he looks surprised as he speaks. He talks about the things he misses most about his wife, not what you would expect, but rather the sound of her snoring and the empty eggshells she left strewn around the kitchen. We order more drinks. The hotel bar is nearly empty. The man carefully keeps his distance, but his words come over to me and plaster themselves over my face and hands in a way I am unused to. The sound of his grief is enormous. We order more drinks. We order more drinks again. We are in the time of not worrying, of not thinking or taking into consideration our own well-being. Our hangovers are like mottled fish swimming over the top of us, occasionally their shimmering shadows falling onto our heads. There is a family in the corner of the bar playing a haunted house board game. 
I watched the man watching them, turning in his seat to observe around. He says, My wife always thought she was haunted. It is a turn in the conversation. Previously, he had been telling me about the things she used to leave around the house, the scattering of hair clips, reading glasses, the orange peelings. He said that after she died, every room looked as if she'd only that moment stepped out of it. And for months and months, he kept finding the things she had left behind, small and awful and wonderful reminders. He says she was descended from the sister of a woman who had died on this land before it was a hotel. And ever since she was a child, she thought there was something inside her that shouldn't be there. This sort of conversation needs movement. We take our drinks and go out through the glass doors into the garden. He carries my drink for me. He is drunker than me and holds both our drinks awkwardly, spilling them onto the flower beds and stepping stones laid out on the grass. He tells me about the demon that lived inside his wife. Her name was Molly or Holly or Polly. He was slurring, and she hadn't told him what she suspected until after they were married. Otherwise, she was logical and stolid, but on the fact of her haunted body, she was immovable, and they had long arguments that sometimes ended in her leaving and not coming back for many days. We walk around the hotel. It is nearly nighttime, but the sun still looks long, and the shadow of the hotel throws itself onto the ground. I cross into it, and the man gives me a strange look, and then shakes his head and drinks again and keeps talking. I am mostly listening, although some of the words get waylaid by the Bloody Mary and cannot really be what he is saying. She was haunted because it was in her genes, the same as eye or hair color. She was related to a woman who had been killed for being a witch in the pond which was covered over when the hotel was built. What happened in the ground stayed in the earth, and trauma was carried in the body like a child. His wife had found the details of this dead woman and become obsessed with the story. He had not believed her at the time, but now he had come to the hotel because perhaps there was some of her here something for him to find. He asked his wife often how she knew her body was haunted, but she was stubborn, and it took a long time for her to tell him. Eventually she did. Firstly, she said, sometimes she said things she didn't mean. Secondly, she said, sometimes she blinked, and she was somewhere and couldn't remember how she got there or what she was doing there. Thirdly, she said, her hands moved without her telling them to. They would knock mugs off the counter. It was true she was clumsy, or cut off her hair. She had done that a few times, or pinch her own arms very hard. She was often covered in bruises, yes. Fourthly, she said, and this was the most important, things grew from her body that weren't supposed to grow. She said the hotel had made her this way. I look at him and laugh, and wait for him to laugh, and he doesn't, and there is an awkward moment. The garden is very beautiful at this time, wild looking, the dying daylight, the long shadows of trees and of the building which we carefully avoid as if we know what we are doing. I laugh again and he shrugs. I ask him what she thought grew. Mostly, he says, green things. She told him that since she was a child, grass and small weeds and moss would grow on her skin and she would have to shave it away. It had been very bad, she said, when she was a teenager. And once, she had woken with a bad pain in her mouth and looking into the mirror, seen a flower unfurling, growing from the soft flesh of her cheek. She said that sometimes she would wake in the morning and her hip bones were crusted with small grass shoots, and her ankles were hidden by a mulch of damp moss, and she would get up and spend an hour getting rid of it. He asked her to let him see, and she wouldn't for a long time, but then slowly she began to show him when something started growing, small dandelions, 
little tangles of what looked like roots expanding out from the skin. There is a slight mania to his eyes now. His delicate hands are scapula-like as he raises them to his face. I step back away from him a little, and the shadow from the hotel falls onto my face. It is very cold, and he stares at me, his hands on either side of his face, stares and stares, and I say, what? And he says, nothing. He says that he noticed it more after that. Sometimes when she spoke, the words would come out tangled as if she was trying not to say them, and he noticed that she broke things more and more often. Her favorite mug smashed from the coffee table, the shower curtain ripped down. She was sometimes nasty in a way he could not understand, made very personal and hurtful comments about his weight or hair loss, about the sounds he made in the bathroom. Afterwards, she would apologize over and over and say that it hadn't been her. She hadn't meant to. Often he would wake in the night, and she was gone. Or she was there, but when he lifted the cover, her feet would be covered in mud. Her nightdress, mucky with grass stains. She was going somewhere in the darkness. But when he quizzed her, she would not say where. He also began to notice that the things growing from her skin were growing faster. By the end of the day, there would be a light fuzz of green across her whole body, her cheekbones thick with growth. You look a bit like her in some lights, he says. We are standing still, and he is holding our empty glasses, and I am holding my crutches and feeling more sober than I want to be. He is peering at me, and then he shakes his head and says he was wrong after all. What did she look like? I ask. And he describes her, and she sounds nothing like me. We go back to the bar for more drinks, and as we come back out into the garden, we have to pass through the shadow of the hotel. And he makes a wretched sound, and there is the noise of his full glass breaking on the stone step. And when I turn back, he is crying, and he reaches out, and presses his hands to either side of my face and says a name, Molly or Holly or Polly, and I step back away from him very quickly and out of the freezing shadow and into the twilight light, and he says, Wait, don't move. I have never been in love, although sometimes when partners said the words to me, I would say them back politely. The small details of another human had always seemed so overwhelming to me, and I would sabotage relationships or allow them to fizzle out, ignoring messages and birthdays, pretending to be busy. I do not understand what it means to go through rooms looking for the hair clips your dead wife has left behind. It is something about the shadow. Yes, we are drunker now than ever, and my mouth tastes like a concrete mixer. It is something about the shadow which somehow makes me look like this dead man's wife. He stands a few steps back, and I move gently in and out of the shadow, and he puts his hands over his mouth and says, Yes, there, now, no, now, there. Oh, God. Oh, no. I take his hands, and we go and stand in the deepest part of the shadow. The darkness is coming down, and soon the whole garden will be black, and the shadow will be just part of the rest. The skin around my ankles and hips and cheekbones is starting to itch, almost unbearably. I take his hands and put them on my face, and he keeps his eyes open as we kiss. His eyes are like rock pools. I touch my hip bone beneath my shirt, and it is mossy with new growth, things sprouting beneath my hands. I do not just look like this man's wife. I am turning into his wife. I feel her coming into my body, like something heavy placed in a pocket. He says my new secret name, 
and he keeps his eyes open as we kiss. And the grass grows from my skin, and as it grows I feel it changing the way I think. And I know now what it means to love someone, and it is a relief to finally know. mother dies a year ago, I come to the hotel looking for her. I ring her phone to hear her here, speaking from death. There is not much I have inherited from my mother, but I have her belief in ghosts. When I was a child, she was fiercely superstitious, and we would leap the cracks in the pavement together turn our eyes from the black cat who sometimes climbs the garden fence to peer into our windows. She would speak carefully, quietly about the dead, as if they were still here, holding her hands in her lap, frowning into the distance. She would tell me stories about the ghosts she had seen when she was a child, up on Pendle Hill through the sideways sheets of rain, in the coal cellar at her grandparents' house. The mirrors in our house faced the wall or were covered in scarves after someone we knew had died. We ate fish fingers and peas and she asked me about my nightmares and nodded seriously. She was very full of fear and she gave this fear to me over the years. She was always obsessed with the hotel, even though she'd never been there. She said that she had dreams about the hotel, that she had a connection to that place. At times when we were fighting so much there was nothing we could say, she would tell halting stories about the hotel and the things that happened there, pulling them from the archive she kept in her head. I do not know she is dying. The last communication between the two of us was a postcard I sent from Italy on a whim after nearly six years of nothing. I wrote thinking of you. There was no reply in return. I do not know she is dying until her neighbour rings to tell me she is dead. I can hear the neighbour's disapproval. If not your child, then who will be there when you are gone? I do not go to the funeral. I had always known I was a girl, but my parents didn't care and called me a boy's name. When my mother used to ring to speak to me, she used the name which I had buried in the ground and don't want to hear ever again. She was talking to someone else, someone who was never really alive. When I go into a women's bathroom, I am so, so afraid, and I try not to make any noise. A lot of my friends have killed themselves in the last ten years and I carry their bodies with me, in my mouth and in my arms. I just want to live and live and live. I just want to be allowed to live. I believe in ghosts, and I am frightened of going to the hotel, but for a week, I cannot sleep. My house feels filled with holes, pockets of danger. I keep feeling a shudder and knowing that my mother is behind me, standing very close, nearly touching me, but when I turn, she's never there. I have to leave the light on when I lie down on the bed. She is in the corners of the room, I think, although I cannot see her there. Deranged with lack of sleep, I stand on the bed and shout for her to speak to me, tell me what she wants. She will not say anything here. In this house, she is silent. I book a room at the hotel and then cancel it, and then book it again and get into the car before I can stop myself. 
It's a nearly seven-hour drive. I buy coffee at service stations and almost turn back five or six times. On the motorway, overtaking in the outside lane, I think I catch a glimpse of my mother in the back seat, looking out of the window. I nearly crash, someone banging on their horn behind me. There is the smell of wet leaves in the car, and when I turn on the radio, there is only a blur of static. When I was a child, I would say I was a girl often, and my mother would grow panicked, enraged, and lock me in the toilet. In the night, the pipes would sing in the walls, and I would lie imagining my mother's ghosts climbing over me, swarming to fill me. I arrive exhausted to the hotel through a sudden storm, which floods the roads and nearly obscures my sight. The roof of the hotel is obscured through the downpour, and I cannot tell if it looks like the drawings my mother used to do and pin up on the fridge beside my crayon scrawls. My mother spoke about the hotel often, but she said she would never come here while she was alive. I was only one of the things she was afraid of. The apple trees are bent beneath the rain, and the thunder is very loud, the scissors of white light blinding me. I hold my bag over my head and run inside. The receptionist behind the desk is facing away from me, and for a moment I think it is my mother grown young. The same severe bob, the same slumped shoulders. But when she turns, she doesn't look the same at all. My room is nice, a big bed, a minibar, a TV that is on when I go in. There was a particular room my mother always spoke about, number 63, but when I asked, they said it was often fully booked. I put my clothes in the wardrobe and sit on the bed and wait. The storm darkens the windows like a hand placed flat against the glass. I can hear the people in the neighbouring room talking to one another, and someone overhead. I close the curtains, and the lightning sends a dull red flicker through them and across the bed and my face. I sit, waiting for my mother to come to me. I do not know how it will happen. I wait for small signs, noises, the kettle or tap turning on, a coldness. Nothing happens. I lie back down to wait, and the tiredness which has been building all week comes down heavily. When I wake, it is much later and the room is very dark. I look for anything that might have changed in the room while I was sleeping, some sign that my mother has come and watched me. But everything is as it was, and after some sleep, it feels ridiculous to have come here looking for her. I'm hungry, and I do not want to stay in the room this way, waiting for her. In the lift on the way down, there is something in the mirror that goes all around the walls, a, a sort of flickering that now and again looks like a man's face and hands. I wonder about leaving, but it is late now, and I've come a long way. I try and press down my fear of this place, which has been building since I was a child who saw my mother's drawings. In the bar, there are a few other people and the bartender, who gives me a menu and then brings me a burger and chips, a glass of water. I eat slowly, looking around, waiting for her to come. She will sit next to me on the bar stool, or stand close behind me and speak to me. I do not know what she will say or what I will say to her. I want very much to talk to her. I will not say sorry, but I will tell her that I missed her. She will be like my mother, but softer and more 
understanding. She will understand everything about me, and she will love me. I finish eating, and the bartender takes my plate away and smiles and refills my water glass. I remember being a child, and somehow I also remember my mother as a child, standing by the steps down to her grandparents' coal cellar, her hair in neat plaits. I ask the bartender the time, but he doesn't seem to hear me. I get off my stool and go back through the reception area towards the lift. The reception space is empty aside for the receptionist, who once more has her back to me, facing towards the long hooks of heavy gold keys. She is facing also a red door with a black doorknob, which I do not remember seeing before, but which must have been there. I take a step towards her, thinking to wish her good night or ask once again for the time. Her hair is cut in a sharp line and her head is bent forward, revealing her neck. I take another step forward and see that the receptionist is wearing a dress I remember my mother wearing when I was a child, blue with a white collar. She says something which I do not hear, not turning. I stand very still. She speaks again, and this time the words come to me, make impact. She says, Are you coming then? Are you ready? And she reaches out and opens the red door so that it, it swings away from us, and beyond, I can see a long corridor that seems to go on and on, the walls of the hotel very narrow and low hanging there. She says my name. Not the name I was given at birth, but my real name. And her voice is my mother's voice, cajoling. I know that this is the sign I've been waiting for. I wish my mother would turn so that I could see her face and speak directly to her. Something is happening with the room. The walls are concertina-ing inwards, folding down, becoming narrow. There is the smell of wet leaves and of damp earth. The red doorway is closer to me now than it had been before, and so is my mother, so close that I can smell the perfume she used to wear, a stale smell. I want to speak to her, so I open my mouth. But when I start talking, the voice is not mine, but my mother's too, high, soft. I go towards the doorway, although I do not remember telling my feet to move. The woman who is a receptionist and is also my mother holds out a hand, and I reach and take it, and we go forward through the door, and at the last moment, before the door closes, the light ceases. I look towards my mother's face. on the phone to my husband. The signal is bad in some parts of the hotel, and he comes in and out. What? he says, when he thinks I'm talking too quietly. What did you say? We have been married 25 years, and for the last year have been planning to divorce. We have not seen one another for more than two months, but we speak often on the phone in a rambling, contented way that we never did when we were married. Sometimes, in the very early mornings, he rings me and says, Did you see that on the news? We do not talk about getting divorced or staying married, and it is possible we will stay in this in-between space for a long time, calm for the first time in ages, the anger between us 
somehow died. Often there are packages from him, books that he has read and thinks I will like. Sometimes he messages, what did you think? I'm never tempted to write back. I think we are the happiest we've ever been. What has also died is the hotel, which my father owned, and before that his father, and which I have run and now is closing. I've tried to find someone to buy it, but no one will. For a long time, the hotel has had a reputation as being haunted, and people came here to see if they would be woken by ghosts in the night. Over the last few years, the reputation soured, and the rumours about the hotel turned bad. Guests stopped coming. There was no money coming in, and I wanted to do something different with my life. I had never seen a ghost in the hotel. In one of our arguments, my husband said I lacked imagination. When I told the receptionist I had never seen a ghost at the hotel, she said that not every haunted place was haunted for every person at every moment of their lives. She was into tarot cards and star signs. On the phone now, my husband says, What's it like? Is it strange? Yes, very strange. I'm the last person here. Weird. Tell me what it's like. Okay. I described to him the rooms emptied of the furniture we've been unable to sell, the bare reception desk, the gleaming kitchen filled with long shadows which I try to avoid moving in and out of. I described the smell which is of bleach and air freshener. I have all my keys on an enormous key ring, a big bunch which I hold as I go along. Did I ever tell you my story about the hotel? My husband says on the phone. I am in the laundry room, checking the plugs. When I straighten, my knees make soft popping sounds. What story? I must have told you, he says. He sounds further away as if he has travelled without my knowing and is in a different country. It is possible that I do not remember his face right, or that he has aged in two months and is now different from when I knew him. The phone line makes a click-click sound, and when it comes back on, I realise he is laughing quietly. An unfamiliar laugh. What? I say. I was just thinking about the story. Do you have time? Shall I tell you now? Okay, I say. I sit on the edge of one of the washing machines. The keys in my pocket dig awkwardly into my thigh, and I have to move them to get comfortable. The hotel makes no sound around me, which is strange because it was always a place filled with noises, an echo chamber of guests and staff. My father used to hold up both hands and say, Do you hear that? A sound which he named contentment, a gentle mutter of onwardness. My husband is talking. I have become distracted and have lost the thread. I begin to listen to him. He is speaking about the times he used to come to the hotel to pick me up or drop off lunch. I can hear him choosing his words carefully, remembering. He would come into the hotel and, without asking anyone where I was, would look until he found me, and then we would go and sit outside or in the kitchen, and I would eat the food while he watched and listened to me telling him about my day. It had been a good moment in a marriage that had become riddled through with awkwardness and selfish acts. We had forgotten how to speak to one another, how to speak about one another to others. At dinner parties with friends, we would drift to different sides of the room, and I would notice an absence in the way we acted and spoke. We might have been strangers. He's still talking. I feel bad for becoming distracted. His voice is soft, and it goes over my face and hands like water. And I pinch my arm and try and concentrate, take in the words... I came one day and I couldn't find you, he is saying. I'd made lunch, a jacket potato and tuna, because I knew that you would have forgotten to eat. I looked for you everywhere, in all the normal places. 
It had never happened before that I couldn't find you. You were often the centre of activity. All the ripples of other events led to you. I began to feel confused and even upset. I hadn't understood right. I couldn't find you. It was too late to ask anyone, and besides, the hotel had seemed so quiet that day, increasingly quiet as I went around. Occasionally I spotted someone, but when I went towards them, they would go off busily. I got angry with you. It was as if you were being purposely difficult to find. There was a red door behind the reception desk that I hadn't noticed before and thought must lead into a staff room. I thought that I heard your voice as I came close to the door, and I opened it, and beyond there wasn't a room but a corridor, low, dingy, a staff way hidden from the guests. I went along the corridor, holding the Tupperware. At the end I came into what appeared to be the reception area, as if I'd looped around. Where before it had been quiet, it was very busy now, bustling, people with bags, the phone ringing and ringing. No one seemed to notice me looking for you. In the kitchen, they were chopping enormous pieces of meat, hacking at them. The floor, slippery. The more I moved around, searching for you, the more I began to realise that this wasn't quite the same hotel it had been before. The corridor had taken me into a hotel which was almost exactly the same, but somehow not quite familiar. There were small differences. Furniture wasn't the same colour. Some of the windows were a lot higher than they normally were. Even the people's faces weren't quite right. I went into the bar, and you were there. Your back was to me, and you were sitting on one of the bar stools, and even from behind, it was awful, because you were the same, but there was something wrong with the way you held yourself, with the way you sat. I understood, looking at you. Listen, I was still holding that stupid Tupperware, that something had gone differently in your life. Nothing big but there had been an infinitesimal change, and though you were my wife, you were also someone completely different. You were talking to a man whose face I could see, flat planes, sharp angles, and you reached out and put your hand against his cheek, and seeing you do this, this awful, intimate thing, I knew that you didn't love me, not just the double you, but the real you, who I had brought lunch to. You had never loved me. It had been a pretense that we carried on because we had no idea what else to do. My husband stops talking. I sit on the washing machine, holding the phone to my ear, pressing it there. I wait for him to say something else. But the story seems to be over. A dream? I say, my voice sounds a little hoarse, as if we've been talking for days. I clear my throat and laugh for one note to show him that I know the story is just a story, that it is okay to carry on with a phone call, to maybe talk about animal memes we've both seen on the internet or reality TV. A dream, I say again, more certain this time. A dream, he says. I don't know about that. I get down off the washing machine and go out into the reception area beyond. There is no door behind the desk, as I know, and I feel myself carefully not checking. I have been over the whole hotel now, and it is time to go. The late light of the day comes through the high windows and strikes the floor in beams. I go to the front door and depress the handle, but it is locked, which I must have done as I let the last staff member leave. I hold the phone between my shoulder and ear, and I go through my keychain, looking for the large, burnished key that I always carry. It is not there. I get down onto the floor and spread out the keys, touching each one, examining them. I can hear my husband's breath down the phone, the small wheeze he sometimes lets out when he is tired. 
or stressed. After I saw you at the bar, he says, I didn't want to go back through the door and into the other hotel, the hotel where the real you or the other you was waiting. I didn't know what I would say to you. I went around the hotel, looking at the things that were different, trying to work out what to do, moving in a daze, my body going without my brain really telling it to. In the reception area, I sat down. There was a man reading a newspaper in one of the other chairs, and at some point he lowered it, and I could see that it was me. We looked at one another. I could see in his face that he didn't yet know about you, about how little you loved me, about how everything would go. There was a cleanness to him, a freshness that I admired. He looked at me with this question on his face, and I understood that if I asked him to, he would go through the door and into the other hotel. He would come back here to you, and I could stay there. I wanted to stay there in that other place. I really wanted to stay there. I am looking and looking for the keys, but they're not there. I go through into the bar and try the door that leads out into the garden, but it is locked, and that key is missing too. I can feel the thrum of something which might be unstoppable. My husband is talking quietly now about other things, about a book he has been reading which he thinks I will like, about a dog he sees when he goes for a walk. I go out of the bar and back into the reception area. I do not want to, but my body takes me there. Through the phone, beneath the sound of my husband's voice, there is a ringing, a low, nearly silent tone, deep. In the reception, I look behind the desk, and there is, yes, a door. A red door. I was in a film in the seventies which has become something of a cult classic now. In the film, I play a young country priest who's fallen out of love with God and is drinking in secret and waking up in the fields, wet with dew, not knowing how I got there. You can watch my audition tapes. They originally wanted a man for the role, but I dressed up as one, and I wasn't good. But there was something about me which I think might have been... desperation. They cut my hair short and bound my chest, and I'm on lists now for the best queer characters of all time and the movies on the LGBTQI films to watch before you die. I wasn't pretending to be a man. I don't think I was really pretending at all. I cut my hair short and they slicked it back with grease and I got thin for the role by accident. When the film starts, the screen is black for two minutes and there is a sound which begins quietly and grows louder and louder. I've sat in dark cinemas and dank sitting rooms and watched the audience and they move and shift uncomfortably and as the sound rises, they grow still and it is the sound, yes it is, the sound of trees falling. Yes, of one tree falling, which brings the others around it down. The film was a horror film. The director was a nobody, but they got a big name to play the mother character, and everyone thought it was going to be a hit. <laughs> we were all drinking and partying, but also working hard, up all night, and then awake again in the early morning, take after take. We were ecstatic. The film was good, and we knew it. But our marriages broke down. We all drank ourselves miserable. A lot of us would never work again. 
in the film, I'm passed out in a field and one of the other priests comes and finds me and leads me to the hotel where a girl's been taken sick and might die. The hotel has long winding corridors with red carpets and blank windows. The girl is ill in bed and I stay with her and her mother through the night, which is long. There is something in the girl, something bad. And there is something in the hotel. And as the night goes on, there is something in me. And in the mother, too. We are bad. We are made bad. We are possessed. Or we have lost ourselves. Almost the whole film takes place in that one hotel room. Number 63. The hotel was famous before the film for being a bit spooky, but afterwards it got really famous. Fans of the film would go on pilgrimages to stay there. You could sleep in room 63, though most of the film was shot. You could buy T-shirts with a photo of the hotel on. After the hotel burnt down, people would still go there to visit the place where it had been, to see if there was anything weird in the land. And there were stories online about what they found crazed animals, words that came from the earth. I'd sometimes find myself wanting to go back there, really just wanting to get in the car and drive and drive until I came to that tree-lined place. I know why people get obsessed about the hotel, go back there over and over. I get it. Things kept going wrong on the shoot. A whole load of film was lost, and we had to reshoot all the scenes again. There was rot in the hotel room we originally used, and the girl started coughing, so we had to move to room 63. We were all staying at the hotel, and I was sleeping with the woman who played the mother, and I was trapped in these long labyrinthine dreams in which I was lost and couldn't find my way out. I'm going around and around, what I have to tell you. I can taste my mouth the way it tasted that night. My hands were shaking and shaking because I hadn't had a drink yet and I kept getting lines wrong, stuttering. The child actress had never been in a film before and was a strange, quiet thing like a lost kitten with big staring eyes and a habit of popping up unannounced. After the film was over, I kept trying to find out what happened to her. There were rumours she went mad or moved to Australia. After the woman who played the mother killed herself, the film got famous again, because she was a big star and people started staying even more often at the hotel. She'd been phoning and phoning me every night between 3 and 4 a.m., but I didn't pick up because I knew that if I spoke to her, I would remember what happened the night of the shoot in room 63, and then I wouldn't be able to go on living. I suppose she wasn't able to go on living. We were shooting some tricky scenes and the director cleared most of the set and I remember the smell of the room when we went in like burnt onions. In the scene, the mother and I are in the bathroom, and when we come out, we think the girl is dead and that she's died while we were in there. And then she wakes or comes back, and there is a fight, and I find God, or I say I find God, but God isn't there, he won't come, and the girl gets out of bed and attacks the mother, tears a tooth from the mother's mouth with her hands. By the end of the scene, there is blood on the floor and on the walls, and it is a climax to the film a moment beyond which there must be change. The shoot was all wrong from the beginning. The night felt so heavy, clammy, resting on our faces and shoulders. In the bathroom, the mirror was angled in a strange position and I kept catching the awful sight of my face in it, my pot-marked skin, my sodden mouth. In the mirror, the mother was looking at me and mouthing something. But when I turned my face towards her, she was looking away. 
I understood, and this wasn't in the film, this is what I felt so strongly, that there was more than one of each of us in the room. We were doubled, and the mirror was showing our doubles. It took a lot of takes to get it right. I was sick in the sink for real, and they kept that in. The sight of my face bent forward. The mother sat on the edge of the bath in a dressing gown, picking at her nails and watching me. The light is yellow, and the walls are close and pulsing. After I'm sick, the mother tells me about the things she wanted for her life and how sometimes she imagines the girl will die and then she will be able to do them. There is a meme of a line, she says from this scene, which I see all over the internet. In it, she holds out her arms and says, I want to be free. I'll be free soon. I'll be there soon, over and over and over again. In the film, the girl is dead, or she is not dead. The mother is on her knees on the floor, howling without making any sound. I'm trying to do CPR, and I can see the girl's eyes moving under her lids. Then she opens her eyes, and she reaches up, and she puts her hands around my neck, and she laughs. And I'm trying to get away from her, because she is stronger than she should be. This is what happens in the film. The mother gets off the floor and says the girl's name over and over again, so that it doesn't really sound like a word anymore. And she's trying to get the girl's hands off my neck, and I'm choking. I was choking, I realised. Not in the film, but in real life. She was stronger than she had been before, and her eyes were like dark spinning plates. I couldn't breathe. The mother is shouting, and then the girl lets go and gets up on all fours like a small wolf and leaps at the mother, and this is how it is supposed to be in the scene. The girl puts her hands inside the mother's mouth and the mother is gurgling and this is how it is supposed to be. And I'm trying to help but I still can't breathe really and then I know something has gone wrong because the mother's eyes are on me and she can't speak and she's staring at me and I go to help and then there is blood sprayed and the girl is holding a tooth which is not the fake tooth but the mother's real tooth and someone is shouting and shouting and I realise it is me. Then all the lights go out. They kept almost all of this on the film. There were lawsuits and big arguments. But they kept it all in. I know that when I die, I will go to a place that is as dark as that room was dark. After the lights went out, nothing was recorded. There were sounds of fumbling and things being knocked over, and I stood very still, and when I opened my mouth to speak, I found that I couldn't. I was struck dumb. There were hands on my face, damp hands, and someone clambered onto me and wrapped their arms around my shoulders and began speaking into my ear, their mouth pressed against my ear. It was the girl. She talked and talked, and I could do nothing but listen to her. She told me everything. She knew what was going to happen, not just the next day or the next week, but in years and years. She told me everything I would do in my life, every repetitious day, every stumbling morning, every mistake, every regret. And in the words, there was something living that moved from her to me and is living in me now. I can feel it in my stomach, curled, shifting, living off me. I could feel the tears running down my face then, but I couldn't move. And the lights came back on and the director was saying something and the girl was back in the bed, nodding sleepily, and there was no blood on the floor or on my hands. The woman who played the mother was looking at me, 
and I understood that she knew that she had heard the way her life would go that she had seen everything sometimes I try and tell people what happened that night I think it will be a relief to say it out loud to have someone else know but until now I've never been able to the words dry up or I find myself speaking about other things I know now that I've said it out loud that the words are in you too inside you I'm sorry I'm sorry for giving them to you I cannot take them back now they belong to you just as much as they belong to me do you feel them? Can you feel them inside you? This is the final story of the Hotel in the Fens. The film begins with a shot out of the window of a car. There's motorway, other cars going past, buses, lorries, scrubby trees, a service station. Someone off screen says, here we go, here we go. The film is unedited. So what follows is a series of quick flashes of the journey. The car and their voices, the back of Shan's head as she drives, Karen's wide grinning mouth as she turns to look at the camera, Kelly's knees, someone's voice lying to their parents on the telephone. Out of the front window, the narrowing of the roads, the scissor away from motorways, the crackle of low branches over the roof. Where are we going? Where are we going? One of them chants. And then Kelly's face is there. The camera turned towards her, held close. We're going to the hotel, she says. After they are gone, there is less left behind than you would have thought. The film makes its way online, social media sites, and then deeper blog posts, the dark web. Their faces are there like stars that are already dead but that still throw out some light. Their words somehow vastly meaningful in a way they must never have meant them to be. What is left behind also, of course, are the gathered accoutrements of a life again somehow made accidentally significant. The bare mattress in Kelly's student room with the dirty sheets balled at the foot, the window left open in Shan's house, and the rain which had come in and stained the floor, a mark almost like a handprint, the smell of the bin in Karen's bedroom which she had not emptied, moulding and rank, the unanswered phone calls from partners or friends. The hotel first appears on the video as a smudge, ashy, through the window of the car. The suggestion of a building which then comes and goes through the trees. The sound of their excited exclamations, the shaking lens of the camera, picking it up and then losing it again. Seen properly, the hotel is unassuming. The chain-link fence around the outside, the boarded-up windows, the ground beneath, scattered with broken roof tiles. There are ten or more long, ashy chimneys left on the roof that is still standing. The garden has grown wild, the earth is sodden, trees tangled together. The three of them roam, looking for entrance, and occasionally it is possible to see inside, through cracks in broken windows or rotten doors, the probability of rooms darkened. They talk over one another, so that most of the words are lost, but when they finally come to the window, not boarded, the glass broken, 
it is quiet, and the camera is switched off. So there is no video of them going in, nor any way of knowing what it might have felt like to clamber, one after the other, onto the rotting sill, and to drop into the cold beyond. The smell, the sound of their own breath, their voices hushed in a sort of reverence. From research on their computers, word documents, email threads between the three of them, they knew most of the hotel's history when they planned to go there. In one particular email, Sean writes that they should type up their conversations, try to collate their findings, so that when the film is done, they can show why they went, what they were looking for, what they hoped to find. They're going to the hotel because... Of everywhere they have researched, it has the most troubling history, seems to offer the greatest possibility of finding what they're looking for. They're going to the hotel also because Shan's mother had died there. Throughout the history of the hotel, there seems to be the suggestion of a pull, bringing people back to a place that they should never rightly want to go to again. The internet is ripe with warnings about the hotel, but still people visit over and over, return again and again. Throughout these warnings, there is a suggestion that this pull does not only last in life, but goes on through death. Put simply, they're looking to catch on film a place that is haunted. This is a description they are scathing of. They are looking to catch on film the uncertain, the uncanny, the marks of something other, a sign of ghostly repetition of the hidden. Rarely do they say, I'm afraid of what we will find, although they are. The sleep app, which Karen uses, shows that she's sleeping barely three hours a night by the time they leave. The messages Kelly sends her girlfriend are often troubled, anxious. In some of these messages, Sean writes to them about her own history of the hotel, about her mother, who worked there as a night porter when she was a child and who left or went missing so long ago that the hotel, the last place she was ever seen, seems to be some important and devastating link in the chain of Sean, maybe, someday finding her mother. They are inside now. There must be a torch strapped to the top of the camera because as it moves, so does the light, pooling and fidgeting at the edges of objects, fallen chairs, ajar doors, smashed bottles. The light picking up also the forms of the other two moving cautiously ahead, bending now and again to get a closer look at something. As they go, Sean narrates falteringly what they are seeing. The ceiling collapsed in some spots, so that, peering up, the camera makes out tangles of electrical wire pulled loose, the edges of other rooms above. In some places, the furniture piled up as if in preparation for a bonfire or to block entrance from other hidden doors. As they approach the stairs, in the emails, it had always been clear that where they were going was room 63. Karen starts talking about what they might see, about what they might find. Sean interjects, disagrees. The camera is moving forward the torchlight loping ahead up the stairs, now dancing, picking up hands, raised arms, a face turned back, the sodden mould on a once white wall, their voices wavering closer and then further away, the first corridor lengthening away with open and closed doors leading off. Sean and Karen having a loud argument, words lost as they turn their faces away about the time they should spend in the hotel. And in the camera, something moves, something they do not see, but which is recorded for them to find 
if they ever went back over the film. In one of the doorways, they pass a small motion. Yes, a figure there looking out, which is then gone. This, the beginning. This, the beginning of it being possible to know what is coming. That they will make their way to room 63. That they were always going to make their way to room 63. Up the stairs, along the next corridor, up again and along. Moments of strangeness which they see too, or which only the camera picks up. Shan appearing to fall ahead and to cry out in pain, and a moment later, back standing there, looking unsure, as if nothing has happened. The doorway to the sixth floor is on the ground, smashed down. In the recording, the girls move in and out of sight, and their voices come from different places, folding around, the words sometimes very loud and clear, as if they're speaking directly into the microphone. Kelly counts the door numbers down quietly, but number 63 is missing, or they do not find it, and have to backtrack and try again. Coming upon it this time, the door open, the torchlight catching the wonky nailed up numbers, the sound of Karen speaking their names inside the room. Although she is not inside, she is there, beside them. What cannot be made out in the recording is the smell of their fear, sweat, and the stench of the hotel around them and the floorboards which seem about to give way beneath their feet, and the feel of the walls when they reach out to touch them, gritty with earth. What cannot be made out in the recording is the dead who have come back to the hotel and who cluster close, trying to touch them. They are in the room now, although there is no footage of how they got in there. The walls are completely black with mold, and the camera moves jerkily, making it difficult to make anything out. Mayhem, a breakdown in vision. Their faces, their faces, someone's hand covering the view. Shan is crying and crying, and she says, what are you doing here? What are you doing here? Karen says, Shan, stop it, you're hurting me. The camera's in the bathroom. And there are words on the walls. Be there soon. The camera is spinning and spinning. Someone says, it's on fire. It's on fire now. For six months after they go missing, their parents and Sean's grandmother appear on the news asking for them to come home. In the shape of their faces, it is easy to make out their children or grandchildren. Sean's nose, Karen's eyebrows, Kelly's stubborn jawline. They ask for information, and also for the girls to come back, promise that they aren't in trouble. It is presumed that they have left of their own free will, frightened after inadvertently setting the hotel on fire. There is footage of the burnt grounds of the hotel busy with firefighters, and afterwards, when it is empty and blackened. The footage of the film is not released, but somehow it makes it online and is watched by groups of teenagers in dark basements or by the girls' parents and friends, their teachers, by skeptics and believers. Sometimes... Kelly's mum will wake in the morning and find, written on the notepad she keeps by the bed, the words, Be there soon. She has never been to the hotel before, but she will go there one day. She will go there soon. Soon.